welcome to the August 6th meeting of the Ann Arbor City Council. If you're able, please rise and join us for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States of the America, United States of America, and to the republic, to the republic for, which stands, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under indivisible, God, indivisible, with liberty and liberty justice, and for, all. justice for all. Would our clerk please call the roll of council? Councilmember Hayner? Here. Councilmember Bannister? Absent. Councilmember Griswold? Here. Councilmember Lum? Here. Councilmember Grand? Here. Councilmember Ackerman? Here. Mayor Taylor? Here. Councilmember Eaton? Absent. Councilmember Nelson? Here. Councilmember Smith? Present. Councilmember Rumlawi? Here. We have a quorum. May I have a motion, please, to approve the agenda. Moved by. Councilmember Bramlawi, second by Councilmember Smith. Discussion of the agenda. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? The agenda is approved. Do we have communications today from our city administrator? Uh, just a couple quick things, Mayor. I just wanted to publicly recognize the, the uh, superb work that our city clerk, her staff, and the many election workers provided to the city. It was a great example of democracy in action. It's very professionally done. Um, and just want to ex express uh, mine and many people's thanks for the job well done. I also wanted to let you know that uh, you have probably seen the campaign, the CARE campaign that uh, the city has had with the downtown merchants about wearing masks. You'll see, see soon see that morph into a joint campaign between the city and the university called Maize and Blue and A2U. Keep your eyes open for that. The focus again is on uh, wearing masks, social distancing, and washing your hands. That's all, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, for an introduction today, we have Dr. Lisa Jackson, Chair of the Independent Police Oversight Commission, Independent Community Police Oversight Commission. Dr. Jackson. Mayor, I have her coming over right now. Excellent, thank you. Hello, hello. So good evening, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lisa Jackson, the chair of the Independent Community Police Oversight Commission. As you know, city council is meeting today on a Thursday because of the election on the 4th. Tuesday's election was historic in many ways, including the record number of absentee and total votes cast in many areas. Kudos again to all of the clerks out there who, who, who did their thing really well. It's also fitting that we meet today because it's the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, which was signed into law in 1965. I, of course, am drawn to think about the late Representative John Lewis, who was literally willing to die for Black people to get the right to vote. But I also think about Diane Nash and other women like Amelia Boynton Robinson, who was actually the architect of the march from Selma, which is the home of my parents-in-law, to Montgomery. From the time of abolition though, men have gotten the attention in the struggle for civil rights. The black women who organized the movements and propelled them forward have largely been overlooked. I appreciate that many of you have embraced the Black Lives Matter movement and the continuing struggle for civil rights. That said, it's important to acknowledge that this isn't a struggle that any of you have lived, so I implore you and the newly elected city, city council members to be diligent about centering minoritized voices and creating space for and consulting the experiences of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color as you continue your work in Ann Arbor and Washtenaw County. It's especially important that we remember the experiences of Black women as we consider the history of the progress that we've made. And having said that, I have some progress to report as well. One of the first things that the Police Oversight Commission asked the police department for was to make their policies public. And some of you are aware that that's happened, but many are not. So I just wanna make sure that we give credit where credit is due and note that the Ann Arbor Police Department has almost all of their policies posted on their website where they're available to the public. Next, as the city is continuing to meet with the Ann Arbor Police Officers Association regarding their collective bargaining agreement, we have met with the negotiating team and made some requests in the interest of transparency, but most importantly, in terms of accountability. 
We've also been meeting with the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, and we're communicating with other oversight agencies around the country who are also trying to make policies to hold police more accountable. And if you're unfamiliar with the topic of accountability and police unions, the July 27th New Yorker has a comprehensive piece on how police unions fight reform at the local and state level through public relations, lobbying, and political contributions. We're also beginning to work on analyzing traffic stop data. I know a lot of you have asked about that and it ranges from 2017 to 2019. The goal is to look at patterns. We don't know if any exist or what they might be, but we'll start to look at that. And also to examine whether there might be more useful data to be collected. And so we'll keep you posted on our progress. And then the last item to report is that after researching policies across North America, Commissioner Sarah Birch and Jude Walton spearheaded the development of a contingency plan for the timely sharing of information in the event of a serious incident regarding the police, such as an officer using deadly force or causing serious injury. The commissioners worked directly with Chief Cox and the city attorney's office also contributed. On July 1st, ICPOC as a whole met and had a robust discussion with the chief and voted to approve the plan. Many municipalities have such an agreement and we believe it'll be useful in getting timely information from the oversight body to the community, which of course improves transparency and accountability. You guys will see the agreement in the minutes from July 21st. Thank you. Thank you. We now come to public comment reserves time. Public comment reserve time is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to council and community about matters of municipal interest. To speak at public comment reserve time, one needs to have signed up in advance by contacting our city clerk. Uh, in order to speak at public comment after having signed up, please dial 877-853-5247. 877-853-5247. Enter meeting ID 968-6715. 8896, that's 968-6715-8896. Speakers will have three minutes in which to speak, so please pay close attention to the clerk who will notify you at the 30 second mark. Uh, when the clerk notifies you at the end of your three minutes, uh, your time to speak is up and then please uh, cede the floor to the next speaker. Uh, our first speaker today is Blaine Coleman. Mayor, I'm going to ask the first two speakers if they are on the line to press star nine um, to indicate what number they're calling from, because I don't see the number um, that they've indicated when they signed up to speak. And I do have a number of additional callers on the line. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, OK. I think I have them here. Hi, is this Blaine? Okay, this is. You have the floor, sir. All right, thank you. Um, you know, the, the mayor has and his coalition have basically come up with a formula that um, is going to guarantee them seats on the city council pretty much forever. And the formula is ungodly amounts of money, first of all, uh, ungodly amounts of advertising, and using the word progressive at least four times on every card that they mail to your house. And they have discovered in this election, that's pretty much a, a surefire formula and nobody can beat it. Um, I think there is a way to beat it. And I think that's by showing some back, backbone, by believing in something for real and by acting like it. Um, I think that's the only way, because otherwise, all of you guys sitting on the city council either either already are lame ducks or you're going to be in two years. So this is your opportunity, in my opinion, to actually stand up for human rights where it counts, to stand up for Palestinian human rights, for example, to be today in the year 2020 what Diane Nash was in the year 1960. To be in year 2020, what Joanne, Joanne Robinson was in the year 1955. Uh, to be somebody who actually stands up for human rights when it's unpopular to do so. And to support the resolution against military aid to Israel. I don't have to tell you that Israel has been massacring thousands of Palestinians. I don't have to tell you that Israel is doing everything it can to steal the land of millions of Palestinians. 
And I don't have to tell you what that means for 300 million Arabs in this world. It means death to them, too. It means that it becomes a lot easier for not just Israel, but the United States to kill unlimited numbers of Arabs. So when you devalue Arab life like that, it means death for an awful lot of people, for millions already. There's been a holocaust against the Arab world just in the last few decades. So you have a duty, I think, to stand up at least for Palestinian human rights, to stand up at least for the resolution against military aid to Israel. And if you show that kind of backbone, if you show that you really believe in something, I think you have a chance to keep your council seat. But if you do what you've been doing, okay, if you do what you've been doing, keep your head down, play it cool. In two years, almost all of you are going to be gone. So stand up for something, all of you. That's all I had to say, and I want to hear what you have to say about it. I'm done. And the next speaker is right in line behind me. That's Mojan. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mojan Savabiasfani. And you heard of rich, politically connected, vile people have invaded an Arbor City Council. This is a group that T Mayor Taylor cherishes and he has been backing them up and now they are going to be hand in hand with him on city council within a few months. Nobody would be able to say no to Taylor anymore. He has all those people lined up to shake their heads and agree with him on everything. Everybody in Ann Arbor knows that now, that the mayor clique has invaded and taken over an Arbor City Council. This herd of rich, politically connected, vile people are backed by huge amounts of dubious campaign contributions. They are here to ensure that business goes as usual in Ann Arbor, as it has, as it has been for the past several rounds of elections, as far as I remember. You can be sure that there will be no Gelman cleanup. There will be no $15 minimum wage. There will be no decent housing at the same time as they yell and scream about affordable housing. There will be no desegregation of our communities while they all call and scream and say that they are for better housing for the poor. Of course, they haven't actually verbally said that. They will call themselves progressives while they are as conservative as it can be. They will lavish you with all kinds of lip service and at the end of the day, Ann Arbor will be more segregated, Ann Arbor will be more polluted and the despicable distance between people's income, which is right now very despicable, will be even more. There will be poorer who will get more poor and rich people who will get more rich under the directions of Mr. Taylor and his newly arriving herd of rich, politically connected, vile people. 30 seconds. The most despicable of them is Ms. Iyer, who is not only despicable because she has ties to black money people, she is also despicable because she is backed by old veterans of the Friends of the IDF. That's Israeli Defense Forces. She is not only, Ms. Iyer is not only connected to dark money people, but she is also backed by the old veterans of the Israel's Defense Time. Forces. Next speaker is Henry Herskovitz. Good evening. I am unmuted. Good evening. Council members have listened patiently over the past 18 years, as some of us speakers have described the state of Israel as a racist state. Some council members have attributed this description as mere name calling from disgruntled citizens. Tonight, I would like to demonstrate 
how the term racist state is an accurate description of the state of Israel and not merely an ad hominem attack. I'll begin by reminding counsel that Israel reissued its nation state law in 2018 and will reference that document as described in Wikipedia. But instead of citing directly, I'll substitute a few words in order to make my point. Consider if someone in the Trump administration were to identify the United States as follows. A, America is the historical homeland of the white people in which the United States was established. The United States is the national home of the white people in which it fulfills its natural, cultural, religious, and historic right to self-determination. C, the right to exercise national self-determination in the United States is unique to the white people. I put it to counsel that these three statements are incredibly racist and that the overwhelming percentage of American citizens would emphatically agree. Yet I created those statements by reciting Israel's 2018 nation state law with the following substitutions. I replaced Jewish with white. I replaced the state of Israel with the United States. The land of Israel with America. I invite council members and listeners to check it out. Americans would not tolerate such a racist and false description of our own country. Why do we not only countenance such a racist description of Israel, but donate $10 million every single day to support such racism? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle Hughes. Hello? Hello, Michelle. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. Hi. Okay, this is Michelle Hughes, and um, I'm here to talk about ranked choice voting. And uh, it's a good day to do that. It's, uh, we just had the, our election, and everyone ran a, a vigorous campaign, and Ann Arbor debated the issues thoroughly. And that's the way campaigns should be. Um, I think that um, I think the ranked choice voting would help us achieve the goal of having a vigorous debate in which all voices are heard. Um, the way it is right now, I think there's a a lot of times when people are discouraged from running, people will say, "Oh, we we already have a candidate," um, and um, people are you know. People I call it a spoiler candidate if they want to run, you know, oh, these people have their candidate. Those people have their candidate. You don't want to be a spoiler, so don't run. I think we should be encouraging everyone to run. And then we can hear all sorts of new opinions and we can debate the topics thoroughly, which is what Ann Arbor loves to do. Um, and I think the ranked choice voting will help us do that um, because people won't be able to be spoilers anymore. Um, You'll be able to put your first preference, your second preference. Um, so that's one of the reasons. So that's the reason I think we should support ranked choice voting um, so that we can hear more from more people, different people. Um, I know there's also going to be some talk tonight about nonpartisan elections. Um, and so I wanted to address that also. Um, I'm less sold on the idea of nonpartisan elections. Um, I think that um, Ann Arbor has shown overwhelmingly over the last several years that they're very interested in supporting the Democratic Party and they're very interested in supporting Democratic candidates. I think if we had a um, if we had a nonpartisan election, then what people would be interested in looking at is, okay, well, who does the Democratic Party endorse then? That's who I'm going to vote for. Um, that's what happens in nonpartisan elections like judges and so forth. But the thing is that um, in the case of judges or school boards or things that are already nonpartisan, the vote goes to whoever can get the most people to a particular meeting of the Democratic Party at a, on a particular night. And that's, 
I think not seconds. a good way to determine that. Um, I'd rather have who gets the party nomination to be determined by vigorous debate throughout the city, which is what we love to do. Um, not just who can get the most people to a particular meeting on a particular night. It's more accessible to have people vote by absentee, vote by mail, and it's um, a better way, I think, to choose our candidates. So I think ranked choice voting with partisan elections, which is what's in front of you tonight, vote for that. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Henry O'Connell. Am I unmuted? You are not, you're ready to go, sir. Great, everyone can hear me okay? Excellent. So hello and thank you to the honorable members of our city council. My name is Henry McConnell. I'm speaking tonight about COVID. First, however, I wanna speak about another historical tragedy. I am the grandson of a Holocaust survivor. I'm speaking after three Holocaust deniers. So I'd like to note uh, the Holocaust was real. It killed my grandmother's entire family along with 6 million other Jews and left my grandmother with lifelong trauma and struggle. I am only here today because Lola Taubman survived the Holocaust. So to the deniers on this call, uh, what do you think of those beings? All right, as for the matter at hand, I'm speaking to you tonight about the urgent need for a downtown mask order. I'm an Ann Arbor native who spent the past five years living in New York City. I relocated back home as the tidal wave of COVID descended on New York in March. And I will never forget the horrors. Many described it as 9-11 in slow motion. Now, since then, New York has become a major success story of virus control and economic reopening. And perhaps the strongest reason is this, universal masking, indoors and outdoors. Scientists say that when 80 to 90% of citizens wear a mask, you contain the spread equivalently to a full lockdown while reopened. New York, which is now in the final phase of reopening, is proof of this at work. Masking has directly enabled reopening. Now, here in Ann Arbor, we have been spared of the worst of COVID, but we will soon see a massive influx of added density with the return of tens of thousands of students. Meanwhile, epidemiologists already cite surging Midwest caseloads. In other words, we will soon be tested once again as a community. Now, crucially, Governor Whitmer's statewide mask order mandates, and I quote, any individual who leaves their home or place of residence must wear a face covering over the nose and mouth when outdoors and unable to consistently maintain distance of six feet or more from individuals who are not members of their household. The penalty for noncompliance is stated as a misdemeanor. Honorable council members, I live downtown, I've been downtown, I've been on the edge of downtown daily, and I repeatedly see this, individuals unable to maintain six feet of distance and not wearing masks. Meanwhile, in the town of our rival school, Michigan State, East Lansing has municipally instituted a downtown masking order to better protect their citizens and economy as the students return from all around the world for fall classes. Honorable council members, I am calling on you tonight to do the same, to institute a downtown masking order before students return and to mobilize necessary resources to peacefully enforce it. By instituting 30 seconds. a downtown mask order, we can preserve the fragile reopening we've achieved even as tens of thousands return to our community. This will prevent further lockdowns and will sustain the local economic activity that has begun to return. Furthermore, I'm calling on all of you to find ways with the city administration to peacefully enforce this outdoor masking order without the use of police force. This could look like in New York City, for example, park rangers who are deployed to dense public areas, freely hand out masks to the crowds, signage, etc. In conclusion, by taking these measures, we can control the virus today rather than letting the virus control us tomorrow. With this order and peaceful enforcement, Time. we can ensure the ongoing health of our economy and of our citizens. Thank you, and I wish all of you health and safety as this pandemic rages on. Thank you. Thank you. Are there communications today from council? Uh, I've got council member Griswold. Uh, pardon my, pardon me, uh, uh, Ms. Beaudry, if you could give me a uh, uh, raising hand, uh, lowering hand privileges or seeing, I'd be grateful. Oh, uh, you should have that. Mm. I don't see perhaps, perhaps no one's, perhaps no one's raised their hand. I don't see any hands up. Okay. I can't find my mechanical hand at the moment. I there. I have mechanical hands up. Uh, so, but but Ms. Uh, Councilmember Griswold, you are you are first in the queue, nevertheless. But uh, it appears to be working with other council members. Oh, Councilmember okay. Griswold, Councilmember Lum. Thank you. Um, the first thing I want to mention is there will be a Dingle Unity lunch this Sunday at noon in Island Park. Uh, 
Invitations were sent out through the Washtenaw County Democratic Party, but in case anyone missed getting an invitation, you can go to my Facebook page for more information. Uh, a mask will be required. We urge you to bring a chair. We'll have a sound system so that you can safe social distance as far away as you want and still hear the speakers. So I encourage people to come. This is the time for unity. This is the time to develop strategies so that we will have victories in November at the state and federal level. Um, I attended a meeting last week regarding the Lower Town study. This is a half million dollar plus study, a traffic study of the Lower Town area. Um, it was conducted by senior engineers and others. They did a safety audit and three things caught my attention. We have less than optimal sign placement. Some of our signs are not in the right place. Vegetation, overgrown vegetation creates sight distance problems. And the third was a lack of lighting. So it was nice to hear senior engineers and transportation professionals repeat what I've been saying for many years. And I hope that given that we're spending half a million dollars that we will actually take some of their statements seriously. Lastly, I continued to work on improvements to the Huron Crosswalk near Thayer. That is MDOT jurisdiction. MDOT right now is on hold because of an organization called SHPO that I'd never even heard of before. It's the State Historic Preservation Office. And they, they seem to believe that street lights are unsightly. Um, I would like to thank Senator Jeff Irwin. His staff is looking into this. I am optimistic that we can still get our RFBs installed this year. Thank you. Councilman Ballou. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to comment briefly on uh, Tuesday's election. Uh, first, I'd like to echo Mr. Crawford's thanks for uh, Ms. Boudry's uh, her staff and uh, uh, teams of volunteers, uh, excellent work in conducting a safe and uh, secure election. So thank you again. Um, for me, I would just say that the voters have spoken and that's the way it, it should be. I called Lynn Song Tuesday night to congratulate her and wish her good luck. Obviously, it's disappointing for me, but I do want to thank my campaign team and all our volunteers and supporters for their incredible effort, hard work and support. I very much appreciate the team's efforts and I also want to thank second ward folks for providing me the opportunity to serve them these last nine years. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you all. Casper Grant. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you again to our clerk's office and our county clerk as well. Um, the efforts were just tremendous in getting those ballots counted safely and getting the information out to people so they could also um, receive it in a safe way. And I, I, I truly appreciate all those efforts. Um, thank you to everyone who ran for council this year. It takes a lot of guts to run for office in the middle of a pandemic. And, um, and I appreciate, I appreciate all of those efforts. Um, just uh, in terms of some parks news, there's a survey out for um, what will eventually be the rebuilding of the bridge at Gallup Park. Um, as well as some improvements of the um, non-motorized border-to-border trail there. So um, that's open until August 14th. So I encourage you um, to share your opinions. They've gotten quite a few so far, but plenty of time to get yours in as well as we make decisions about, um, about that park. And then finally, I want to wish a very happy birthday to my partner in public service to the people in Ward 3, Zach Ackerman which is tomorrow. Happy birthday. Further communications from council, council member Lowy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just real quickly, um, I'm one of the two council liaisons, or not liaisons, but part of the DDA partnerships committee um, meet that meet every two months with other local institutions, um, myself and council member Lum. Um, we get together and have a, a free flowing discussion. And uh, recently the, the DDA has um, decided to rename that committee from uh, our, our partnerships committee 
uh, to the affordable housing and economic development. And so um, I just wanted to make sure that council was aware of this um, shift in focus uh, when it comes to the partnerships committee uh, that we have two council members uh, reporting to and uh, the DDA now has uh, decided to shift its its primary focus um, and, and more on on the affordable housing aspects of of our community. So um, it's a, a positive development for many in our community. Uh, and uh, so more to come on that. And uh, just on some sombering news, it is uh, the anniversary uh, that the world unleashed the atomic bomb uh, 75 years ago today. Uh, and I hope that day never uh, is revisited. So uh, 75 years ago today, we unleashed, unleashed a, uh, a terrible technology and uh, hopefully we can find a way uh, to rid ourselves uh, of nuclear arms um, uh, real soon. Further communications from council? I have a couple of uh, communications. First, I'd like to uh, echo my thanks, uh, echo the thanks that uh, has been uh, you know, lavished uh, by others upon uh, and the, uh, you know, our clerk's office and the, uh, the whole election administration. Um, it's a, uh, an unprecedented uh, effort conducting uh, an election, of course, in a pandemic uh, with such uh, massive vote by mail um, subscription. Uh, and so, you know, the, the uh, staff has once again uh, done Ann Arbor proud. It gives me a, a high level of confidence uh, that we uh, will be able to pull off the, uh, the election in November, uh, which will you know, have even more moving parts, even more absentees uh, with, uh, with a plum. So well done. Uh, I'd like to make a good, so let's take care of this first. Did I just lose that? Uh, I'd like to recommend the, the following nominations for your consideration uh, for, oh, here we are, uh, for your consideration at our next meeting to the Energy Commission. Larry Kerber, Bridget McComber, Ember McCoy. I'd um, also like to give a brief update on the search for a permanent city administrator. Uh, by resolution of the city council, a process was set for the city administrator search. Uh, the first search, uh, phase has been completed, that is to say hiring a recruiter and gathering of input from the council and the executive team. Uh, posting for the position was closed on July 26. Uh, the recruiter has provided the whole of city council with background information on 10 semifinalists. This information is confidential at this point uh, as the applicants uh, and limited to the council members as applicants often apply in the context of confidentiality. On Monday, the 10th of August at 5 p.m. at a special session, this pool of candidates will be reviewed by the council as a whole in closed session. In open session on that same day, the whole council we, it is intended will move forward to approve a group of finalists, usually between three and five. After that, the finalists will be announced and the biographical material will be made public. Interviews with council, community members, and staff will take place on August 20th. The administration committee uh, has uh, recommended unanimously that the residents who were selected in the Tuesday primary to be nominees of the Democratic Party be invited to participate in the community panel. There will also be a public participation component for all finalists. Um, as set by prior resolution, the council will be uh, set in special session the week of, uh, rather the council will set a special session the week of August 24th to further discuss the finalists and the information received in the prior week. We now have before us the consent agenda. May I have a motion please to approve the consent agenda moved by council member Ramlawi, seconded by council member Smith. Discussion of the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The consent agenda is approved. We now come to a set of public hearings. Public hearings are opportunities for members of the public to speak to council and the community about a specific item on the agenda. That is to say the specific subject matter 
of the public hearing. To speak at a public hearing, you need not have signed up in advance, but your speech must relate to the subject matter of the public hearing. To speak at one of these three public hearings, please call 877-853-5247. That is 877-853-5247. Once you've done that, enter the meeting ID 968-6715-8896. That is 968-6715-8896. At the public hearing, when we have, after we've announced the public hearing and it's gotten underway, please indicate your desire to speak by entering star nine, star nine. The clerk will identify you by your last, when it is your turn to speak by the last three digits of your phone number. Star nine, last three digits of your phone number. Uh, speakers at public hearings have three minutes in which to speak. So please pay close attention to the clerk who will notify you at the end, uh, notify you when you have 30 seconds left and when your three minutes are up. Once your three minutes are up, please uh, conclude your comments and cede the floor to other speakers. Public hearing number one, an ordinance to amend section 1265 of chapter 11, risk fund of title one of the code of the city of Ann Arbor. Is there anyone who'd like to speak at this public hearing? If you wish to speak at this public hearing and have dialed into the number mentioned uh, that is, you, is appears on your screen and is mentioned above, please enter star nine now. Mayor, we have a number of callers on the line, but they do not appear to have their hands up for this particular hearing. Thank you. If anyone wishes to speak at this hearing, please enter star nine now. Thank you. Hearing, uh, seeing no one, this public hearing is closed. Public hearing number two, an ordinance to amend Title Seven, Business and Trades of the Code of the City of Ann Arbor by adding a new chapter, which shall be designated as chapter 97, short-term rentals. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak at this public hearing? To speak at this public hearing, please enter star nine now. If anyone would like to speak at this public hearing with respect to short-term rentals, please enter star nine now. Caller 646, but you can go ahead and speak. Caller Hello, with the yeah. phone number ending. Oh, go ahead. Mayor Taylor, council members and city staff. My name is Kevin Grotowski and I'd like to express my concern over the proposed short-term rental ordinance as it's currently written. Despite the wishes of many in this community and even some members of this body, the ordinance remains unchanged and includes overly restrictive measures and problematic language that will do real damage to various groups and stakeholders throughout this community. Many of whom have spoken either here tonight or in citizens who you represent, but whose comments have fallen on deaf ears over these many months. No one is saying that short-term rentals should not be regulated within the city of Ann Arbor. In fact, registration, licensing, and eliminating problematic properties is pretty much supported by all. The simple fact is Ann Arbor does not currently have any regulations or classification of rentals based on term length. All non-owner occupied SCRs in the city, as long as they've complied with the housing code, passed all inspections, and are licensed have been operating as legal rentals. This ordinance, which will ban non-owner occupied STRs throughout most of the city and proposes a change to this status quo. And because the rules governing rentals are potentially changing, licensed non-owner occupied STRs are the definition of a legal non-conforming use under this new ordinance. I ask the council, please govern with a light touch and base any regulation on facts and figures and not vague feelings or anecdotes. Please send this ordinance back to city staff to revise and include provisions to grandfather legally operating non-owner occupied short-term rentals. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Caller 693, phone number ending in 693. Hello, my name is Wendy Carmen. 
I live at 2340 Georgetown, and I've spent many years on the ZBA as well as on various land use committees. It's my understanding the city received many complaints from citizens whose lives were disrupted by intrusive and abusive activities occurring only after this new idea became popular. The consultant the city hired to determine <clears throat> uh, to survey STRs found we couldn't state with certainty how many there were who were doing it or what proportion had ever gotten any permits. Staff has now presented you with a proposed ordinance that provides some measure of regulation over owner-occupied units and non-owner-occupied units in non-residential areas and would shut down non-owner-occupied units in, resident, in residential areas. Understandably, the owners of these businesses in our neighborhoods have threatened lawsuits and are probably backed by Airbnb money. They're making claims that their units were legally established and you must at least grandfather them in. Did we knowingly give them permits to rent an STR or did they get permits for long-term rentals? We do have language in our zoning chapter now in the UDC which basically prohibits them. I would argue that no STR was authorized by the city because our ordinances and definitions do not permit them. Our definition of who can occupy residential units is based on definitions of family and fungal family that require some measure of permanence that would not permit STRs. If any are to be grandfathered, they would probably have to prove that they were in existence before the current definition, some family and functional family were introduced into our ordinances. I think we can decide that there are some categories of SDRs that we want to encourage and some categories of STRs that we do not want to encourage. The question is not should we pass legislation. We need to pass the legislation. But the question still is what should happen to the non-owner-occupied units in residential neighborhoods? Under what circumstances and with what super regulations would we be willing to grandfather them in? If you pass this today, it will not become enforceable for 45 days. I implore you to use that 45 days to make a thorough assessment of what our case would be and let council decide whether to hold discussions with these owners. With this process in place, we can come to an agreement that uh, exactly what, an informed agreement about what we would like to do about this. Thank you. Thank you. Caller ending and phone number ending in 815. Hi, I'm a property owner in the fourth ward and I'm respectfully requesting the proposed ordinance restricting non-owner occupied STRs be sent back to the city administrators for revision. An inclusion of legal non-conforming status for legally operating landlords is a right that has been upheld by the Michigan Supreme Court. We purchased our property two blocks from our first Ann Arbor home and, our, and the neighborhood is special to us. Our neighbors have taken great interest, appreciation, and relief. Over the 18 months, we have completely renovated a noise and drug nuisance home and an eyesore on the street. We have done the work ourselves as a passion and as a work in our retirement. We do not, as ridiculously suggested by council members, operate our rental in the wild, wild west of Airbnb, and we do not do it for the highest and best price. We certainly do not rent to drug dealers. To compare us to this is insulting. Our intent was never to long-term rent or to flip and sell, as we have also been told our, our, our options by council members, which is inappropriately and grossly presumptive. We vet our renters because we want our property cared for and respected. We have developed life friendships with many of the families who have stayed with us and plan to return next year. These people have also gotten to know our neighbors during their stay. Our next door neighbors cannot fathom why the city is so against us. They are grateful for our presence and our contribution to the neighborhood character. They said they were a bit worried in the beginning about living next to an STR, but that our presence has been an improvement on the street. We help our neighbors with whatever they need and are present at the home every day. It is not rented. For all of the work we have done, the double taxes we pay, the relationships we have developed, we are set to be penalized 
despite a Supreme Court ruling. I am proud to be part of a very small group of committed and responsible non-owner-occupied owners. We have been asking, pleading for this city to sit down and work with us to develop a fair win-win policy on STRs, and we have effectively been ignored. Not once have we been asked to sit with the city to negotiate. It's bad governance by an elected council. We appreciate the support from those of you who value a reasonable and fair approach that would protect our existing rights. We have worked hard for our rights. We are organized. We have the will. We have the resolve. We have the support of the Supreme Court, and we have the resources to protect this right. To take this down an expensive path for the city is something that do, for something that does not merit that expense is a disservice to the taxpayers. We ask that this ordinance be sent back to the city for the revision to grant us legal non-conforming status, reasonable and fair. Thank you. Thank you. Caller ending and phone number 692. Caller 692, you can go ahead. Hello, um, my name is Kay Adefixo. I am a owner of a non-occupied SPR. Um, pri um, prior in the process when they sold, um, I tend to um, regulate this SPR to buy. I give it a talk at one of the commission's um, meeting in the evening. And I, I can't again to, to say that these properties, these non-owner occupied SDR, which I own one of, we have been hosting a number of families. And I talked about some of the families that we do service in this community. People who come to the hospitals and to take care of their family and they needed a place, a safe place to see to stay. Even more so now in the time of this pandemic, we've even seen more people who had more options where they could stay in a, in a space that is free of any fear of who they are interacting in the hallways of hotels. And um, if we all really look at this, and we don't understand what the rush is to have to actually vote on this and get this done fairly quickly. There are a number of cities all around the country and all over the world that are hosting short-term rentals. And the, the paranoia here in this city that this has to be taken care of really gives me a sense that there may be some powerful or self-interest that is behind all of this. When we first started talking about this, we talked about this in terms of this is how we create affordable housing. That is really ridiculous. We all know that. And if anybody sits in this council now actually believes that this is a way to take care of affordable housing, they are fooling themselves because they know it's true. But really, the issue here is because there are powerful backdoor dealings that is talking about how we make sure that this doesn't become a thing in an hour. We provide a service. We provide a service for people who come to this community looking for places to stay while they make decisions about staying here, whether they are being recruited by the hospital or they are being recruited by the university. We provide a service seconds. for people who are doing programs over here that they needed a place to stay. We provide places for parents who come to visit their children as they are in the university over here for a place where they can host we, have, we provide places for people who, are, who come here to, to visit family members as well. These are properties that we take care of, we pay our taxes, we, we register our properties, and we abide by every rule that is created by the city. Time. So now, John. Thank you. Caller ending in phone number 811. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Stearns. I live on Newport Road and I want to thank the council for dealing with this issue. 
Uh, it's been a problem for me ever since a motel moved in next door to me in my residential neighborhood. And I would like to live in a residential neighborhood again instead of next door to a motel. Um, there's an investing community out there that has figured out how to monetize Ann Arbor's residential neighborhoods. And I would like to have a neighbor again, rather than three different people every week, six, eight cars, parties or not parties or families or whatever. I just want to have a neighbor. And I thank you for dealing with this. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I read the, uh, the legislation and there's a pretty big hole in it right now. Uh, the hole being the section about principal residence, whole house, short-term renting. So if a, a place where there are investors or an investor who has acquired a property that in a, in a single family neighborhood and turn it into a motel, if they can sign a lease with somebody in the company, somebody in the family, somebody, anybody, uh, then they can continue to running the motel. Uh, nobody really has to live there. Nobody has to stay there. You could have the cleaner sign a lease. Uh, so what I would like to ask that council put in an amendment or, you know, do something is to put a, n a number of limit on the day, uh, limit on the number of days per month that that exception, principal residence, whole house rental can be done per month so that it's only really uh, availed by somebody who actually lives there as opposed to somebody who's going to pretend to live there. Um, but once again, I, I really thank you for dealing with this. It, uh, the lack of legislation has been a big problem with me and the peace and quiet and enjoyment of my property. And I think that um, it's long overdue, uh, the monetization of our residential neighborhoods. Uh, that's all I've got. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Caller ending in phone number 280. Hi, caller 280. You can go ahead. Hello, I am, um, my name is Lola and I'm a property owner and I'm here uh, to ask that council uh, send this ordinance back to city staff for the purpose of exempting legal operating non-resident short rental, short-term rental properties from this ordinance. As many uh, of the, uh, my fellow owners have said, we were operating legally. We have not violated any city rules. And we're not asking you to fill down the ordinance. We're simply asking for a grandfathering or, or, or a legal non-conforming status uh, be offered to us here. This ordinance could have been proposed with this protection in place, yet it has not. There are over 50,000 dwellings in Ann Arbor and only about 100 are non-resident short-term rentals. And many of us, as you have heard, are Ann Arborites. We live here. We live next door to our property and we take care of our property and we have uh, people that we employ as part of this businesses, as part of this uh, home. And so we are asking that you really ha consider us. And again, many people have said this, it's very disappointing that council member in the last meeting was comparing us to drug dealers and suggesting that we're being backed by big corporation or Airbnb. I'm a single family person who lives in Ann Arbor and I don't have any backing of anything. I'm just trying to um, live affordably in the city and, and earn some money uh, on a property and to be uh, compared to corporation or drug dealer, it's hurtful. I'm a member of this, I, I pay taxes and I support many of uh, the initiatives uh, in this city. So I'm asking for you to understand that we are people too. And I don't understand why somebody's desire to live next to a neighbor on one side should override my own right as a property owner. It's, it's absolutely just not fair. As many people as before me have stated, many of the current owners here 
the non the, the amount of non owner occupied SDR is less than one percent. So this is not about affordable housing. We are not the thirty seconds of affordable housing uh, in this city. We're just asking for you to understand that we put our sweat and blood, at least I know I have, into this and you you block in without giving us this uh, non confirming right, we'll have devastating financial issues to all the money. My, you know, my savings that I've invested in this. When I did not, I looked and there were no rules on the book uh, that said I couldn't do this. And now you're going to change the rule and Time. essentially ruin. Caller with the phone number ending 626. <clears throat> Caller 626, go ahead. Hi, my name is Eric Zugabe. Uh, I'm a realtor in the NRA area. I work with a lot of single family owners and owners with investment properties. Uh, no matter who they are, they deeply care for the city of Ann Arbor. Many of the people I work with, whether they are occupying their property or not, consider renting out their property, either for long-term rentals or short-term rentals. I employ this, implore the city council to consider the financial hardship, not only for those who have set up an infrastructure for short-term rentals for their own livelihood, but for the property owners who have purchased property in Ann Arbor to live, but have the option in the future to rent out their properties as short-term rentals. Eliminating this option is an elimination of homeowner rights. I would also like the city council to consider their own argument that short-term rental properties are a threat to affordable housing in the city of Ann Arbor. Short-term rentals represent less than 0.2% of the housing stock in Ann Arbor. If this continues to be an argument of the city council, I suggest they search for better numbers to fit their argument. Lastly, I ask the council to please move to send this ordinance back to city staff for the purpose of exempting legally operating non-resident short-term rental properties from this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 509. Hi, caller. this is Heidi. Hi, this is Heidi Posher, 1204 Brooklyn. I'm with a group of about 50 short-term rental property owners that would seriously be damaged if the city enacts the ordinance before you tonight. Um, yes, we are very serious about claiming rights already granted to us by the Michigan Supreme Court, even if that means litigation invested substantially in legal representation so that we can engage in this process knowing exactly where we stand. We do appreciate that there are members of council that feel very strongly about the need for this ordinance. We see your passion and we have listened respectfully. We don't even have a problem with council creating new rules to protect the property rights of city residents. The problem is that as proposed, these new rules trample our property rights. Not only is this incredibly unfair, legal. The ordinance could have been proposed with these protections in place. As many people have mentioned, there are over 50,000 dwelling units in Ann Arbor. There's about 100 to 120 non-resident short-term rentals. Granting an, an exemption for these properties will make no difference in the success or failure of this ordinance for the city, and it will protect us from financial devastation. Ironically, part of the financial law will be the investments in systems, employees, and training that make us responsible neighbors at the short-term rentals we own. A legal battle wouldn't be mounted out of anger or frustration. It will be mounted out of necessity. Just as an aside, uh, I, I hear the people that are struggling with situations in their neighborhoods with um, any form of Airbnb. And I would propose that with a good implementation of this ordinance and with the help of the people that have been running non-resident short-term because we have staff, we have systems, we have, uh, we have trained people working for us. We could really help out with this situation um, in terms of helping the city develop guidelines and policies um, that, would, that would solve many of these problems. Um, we understand that the administration believes that with careful wording, they've found a loophole that will allow them to implement this ordinance without any concern for Michigan law. However, at the end of the day, this ordinance will be financially devastating to a specific group of property owners, and that is why legal nonconforming law was put into place. We've already gone to a great deal of expense to make sure that we don't come to council without landish or unwinnable claims. 
Having already made a huge investment in protecting our rights, we have little to lose in continuing to pursue them. We are not a mob of angry villagers with torches and pitchforks arbitrarily threatening to sue. This whole issue turns on a zoning ordinance disguised as something else in order to skirt Michigan law. In the process, in the process it's damaging property owners. It's, it's an extremely transparent end around, and I invite you to consider the optics of that as we push forward towards resolution. Please send this ordinance back to the administration with directions to treat existing legal non-resident short-term rental property owners fairly through the creation of an exemption. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 679. Hi, my name is Katie Dorch and I'm a home. Oh, can you hear me? You bet we can. Okay. Okay, I'm a homeowner in the fourth ward and I'm here to address the ordinance to ban short um, non-owner occupied STRs and respectfully and humbly ask that you please move to send this ordinance back to city staff and amend it to allow non-conforming status for law-abiding owners like me. I'm a third generation Ann Arbor resident. I'm a parent to four girls, soon to be five. I'm a wife of an Ann Arbor law enforcement officer. I'm taxpaying and voting resident of this city. I maintain positive relationships with all of my neighbors my kids have attended Ann Arbor schools and we are active in our community. I am not backed by a big bank. I'm not an investor and I do not have a trust fund. I'm not interested in buying up hundreds of homes in the city to pad my wallet. I'm a middle-class working Ann Arbor resident, just like many of you who saved my money and invested in a home with hopes that in the long run, it will pay off for the future of my family. My husband and I bought our home not to make thousands of dollars, but to invest in a home that either we or our kids will someday live in. We don't make loads of money off of our home like many of you seem to believe. And in fact, this year, the financial impact of COVID has been quite devastating to us and so many other homeowners. Nonetheless, we continue to invest what money we can in our home and improve the neighborhood presence and overall quality. I represent a group of about 50 other short-term rental owners in the city. And perhaps to your surprise, we do not operate our rental properties like the Wild Wild West. This is a home to me, not a property. I strictly enforce rules, vet and review all of my renters, never allow parties, follow housing code occupancy regulations, and take immaculate care of both the interior and exterior of my home. When I purchased my home, there was no city ordinance or law stating I could not rent my home on a short-term basis. In fact, there was no definition of short-term rental that even existed in this city. I followed all the rules as outlined by the housing code for rental properties. I remit occupancy taxes and my property has been thoroughly inspected. When I bought my home, there was no legal distinction in the city between short or long-term rentals. There was no 30-day rule. I have been operating my home legally according to the city of Ann Arbor. My family made a choice to rent our home on a short-term basis, not to squeeze every last dollar out of it that we could, or operate at the highest profit margin, but because we wanted to use our home as well. We wanted to have frequent access to our home so we could maintain and upgrade the property. We wanna be able to share our home with family and friends and people in need. And we wanna be able to use it ourselves and stay there when we choose. We have rented our home to some of the most lovely visitors to our city, as well as local Ann Arbor residents and shared our home with people in dire circumstances and health crises. Passing this ordinance as written could some of the people before you into a devastating financial situation and destroy the investment we have made. Please understand, if you choose to move forward with this ordinance, do so in a way that grants owners like me legal non-conforming status. We are asking to maintain the rights that we had prior to the discussion. The Michigan Supreme Court has affirmed our stance and our rights, and you should too. Litigation is the absolute last path we wanna take, but we understand we need to stand up for our rights. Please send this support back to city staff and ask that they allow for, for legal non-conforming status for homeowners like me. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 111. Caller 111, you can uh, go ahead. Yeah, this is, can you hear me? You bet we can. Okay, uh, my name's Pat Lennon. I know many of you. I'm an attorney with the Honigman Law Firm. I represent Noah Hoffman and a group of residents that oppose the new short-term rental ordinance. Uh, you've probably heard many of my clients discussing tonight uh, their feeling about the unfairness of the ordinance and how it will uh, you know, eliminate an existing permitted use and deprive these residents of a critical source of income that supports their family and their properties. I'm not going to use my time talking much about that because I think they'll cover those issues. 
I'm going to use my time covering some of the legal issues related to this ordinance. First, as you probably saw, I, I provide a letter dated Ju July 16th, which uh, explains that the city does not have the legal right to eliminate an existing lawful use without, at a minimum, providing legal nonconforming use status. In other words, if a resident has been using their property lawfully for short-term rentals prior to the imposition of the ordinance, they are legally entitled to continue to do so afterward. The Michigan Supreme Court reinforced this principle with respect to short-term rentals in Room versus Spring Lake, which was decided, I believe, in June. The Room case stands for the proposition that existing lawful short-term rental properties are entitled to legal nonconforming use status. In other words, existing lawful uses are grandfathered and can continue after the passage of a new ordinance that would otherwise prohibit them. In this case, the current draft of the ordinance does not allow existing lawful uses to continue after the imposition of the ordinance. It would eliminate them. In so doing, it violates the rights of those uses and users and entitles them to their damages. But no one wants to go there. We would like to see the ordinance modified to clearly allow existing lawful uses to continue after passage. We've heard the position that the proposed ordinance is not a zoning ordinance and that rights to legal nonconforming use or to referendum would not apply. We think that position is without merit. Michigan law is clear that disguised zoning ordinances cannot be applied to terminate a vested land use. In this case, the elimination slash restriction on the use is directly tied to the zoning classification of the property and also relates directly to a previously permitted use of these properties. As such, the substance of the restriction is in the nature of a zoning ordinance, not a federally applied regulatory ordinance. Uh, we would cite the cases of aggregates, natural aggregates versus Brighton and Square Lake Hills uh, for, the, for, the, for the test that relates to whether an ordinance is regulatory or zoning. It's determined based on the substance of the provisions and terms of the ordinance and its relation to the plan of zoning in the city. In this case, the applicability of the short-term restrictions are based on the zoning district of the property. Under the ordinance, use short-term rental cannot be conducted at all. Fine. It's entirely eliminated in certain districts, and that is not permitted. Uh, and Thank you. Thank you. Caller ending in phone number 400, caller 400. Hi, uh, thank you, Mayor Taylor and city council members for this opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Ben Ranta. I've been a long time resident of Ann Arbor in the fifth ward. I'm a combat veteran and a blue collar worker. Four years ago, I invested my savings for my time in Afghanistan to buy and renovate a home just down the street from where I currently live. Like the previous callers, I expect to live in a quiet, peaceful neighborhood too, but I should have the right to rent this home out on a short-term basis. It's a falsehood for someone to say that I am financially backed by Airbnb. My and, and my colleagues' efforts are purely grassroots. I'm only motivated by the fact that I am proud of the home I renovated and want to keep my financial head above water so I can hang on to it. If the city is simply enforcing the existing ordinances and zoning language, why is there a need to draft a completely new and standalone ordinance uh, in the first place? I am frustrated that city council continues to make this an affordable housing issue. Some members of city council and city staff officials at their own admission have not collected the necessary data to objectively view the situation as it is. By best estimates, only one or two homes for every thousand is a non-owner occupied STR. This small amount of homes will not negatively impact affordable housing in Ann Arbor in any meaningful way. This is still good rhetoric that distracts from the real issue. So for the, for the past four years, I've been obeying all of the current Ann Arbor rental laws. So the real issue here is that my rights to property owner are being stripped away. And I've, and, and I've been saying this in city council, asked for committee feedback uh, for any potential short-term rental uh, ordinance. So I use my modest savings, as, the modest savings I paid while in Af Afghanistan to purchase and renovate a home in Ann Arbor. It is a violation of my rights as a property owner to be told that, that what I've been doing legally for the past four years is now a violation of the city ordinance. I refuse to accept here that in Ann Arbor, a progressive and well-educated city, a provision cannot be made to accommodate the small number of us 
who will be financially cut off at the knees. The right action to take now is to amend this ordinance. Show us that you're listening to our concerns. I'm asking someone on council to stand up. Don't allow yourself to be bullied into silence and propose an amendment to this ordinance to allow for non-conforming use status for non-resident owner-occupied uh, STRs. 30 seconds. Everyone on council has shown that they are civic leaders who have served the city honorably. I'm proud to be an Ann Arborite. Before a moment, I ask you humbly to put yourself in my shoes. Consider the financial impact this will have on me and my family. Please act in accordance with the best interests of all your constituents, as to our short-term rental owners included. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Caller ending in the phone number 520. Good evening. My name is Paul Callum. I'm an attorney representing Prentice Partners of Ann Arbor LLC. Prentice is a real estate management and development company based in Ann Arbor with a portfolio that includes both long and short term rentals. Because the proposed STR ordinance would ban current lawful city sanctioned rentals in residential neighborhoods, we oppose it in its current form as both unfair and illegal. I think the unfairness issue is obvious as many speakers have already addressed. I would like to focus my comments on the legal issues as did Mr. Lennon. Uh, both the Zoning Enabling Act and Michigan Supreme Court precedent make clear that use of a dwelling and land that is lawful at the time of enactment of a zoning ordinance may continue, although the use does not precisely conform to the new ordinance. Prentice's STR properties have been operating lawfully and with the express permission of the city. Current zoning does not prohibit their operation, Prentice has registered each of its rental properties with the city. They have been inspected and hold certificates of compliance issued by the city. The proposed STR ordinance makes no allowance for the continued operation of these and similarly situated registered non-owner occupied rentals in res residential neighborhoods. We estimate there are approximately 120 of such properties in the city currently. Mr. Delacorte, Community Services Area Administrator, has acknowledged that these uses would be banned under the proposed ordinance as currently written, but he has argued that the ordinance is a regulatory measure, not a zoning ordinance, that rentals of more than 30 days are allowed, and so, he argues, rental use has not been banned. I hope the City Attorney's Office has disabused counsel of this notion because it is not the law. Case law refers to such arguments as disguised zoning, and courts have rejected it as impermissible, uh, an impermissible end around, if you will, of non-conforming use rights, whereas here, the proposed ordinance regulates activities by location. The city's proposed STR ordinance eliminates non-owner occupied rentals of 30 days or less in residential neighborhoods. It mandates a fundamental change in current use of a small set of properties based on their location. 30 unless seconds. The city, unless the city expressly exempts current lawful use, Prentice and others similarly situated will be forced to seek redress in the courts. My client is before counsel. Uh, we're all here in a good faith effort to avoid litigation. We are not here to argue that the entire ordinance be scrapped. It is our hope that counsel will recognize that the ordinance as drafted is flawed, there are workable solutions, and that it will direct staff to propose a framework that accommodates existing lawful non-conforming uses. Thank you for Hi. your consideration. Thank you. Caller ending in the numbers 936. Hello, uh, this is Zachary. I'm at 551 South 4th Avenue and we're, we're still in a pandemic and there are a lot of people who don't have homes and a lot of people whose number one worries are being evicted. And um, from hearing that there's only 120 of these units that are being operated as non-owner occupied short-term rentals, that's 
120 families of essential workers who can't live in the community. Um, so, you know, owners, it, good good job that you're able to buy additional houses. Um, if you want to, um, you know, keep your investment, why don't you convert it into a long-term rental um, and give uh, somebody a place to live? Um, I, it might be a better investment for you as well, because I don't know how many people are going to be seeking short-term rentals once all the cases and deaths start to increase. And we need to come together as a community to support, um, to support each other. Um, so really uh, 120 units is a big number to me and it's a big number to every single family or individual who would be able to find a uh, permanent residence in the city and contribute um, as um, workers in the city that we deem essential with our signs outside of our lawns. Um, we, we've built so many hotels in the city downtown in spots that could, could have ha um, been used for apartment buildings. And, um, you know, you, you all know the numbers of what council has failed to produce in uh, the report uh, of how many housing units we need per year um, since 2015 or something. So, you know, we need to look at this problem from all angles that we can and 120 units is 120 units. Um, 30 seconds. And that's a big number for me. So, yeah, it's, I'm really not buying the argument from owners that have an extra house available that they could rent out another way um, and help a family in need. Um, so I just ask those owners to be a little less greedy and um, consider renting your house to someone who'd like to move into your neighborhood and you'll have an extra neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Caller ending in 298. Caller 298. Yes. Um, my name is Bridget O'Connor. I have been a resident since 2004 and now live in the fifth ward. At last month's city council meeting, there was a commitment made by a city official to remove the discriminatory language in the short-term rental ordinance, specifically referring to, quote, maintaining neighborhood and community character. I'm disheartened to see that this remains in the final draft of the ordinance. When considering why we are maintaining a majority white affluent community, this can only be viewed as having racial undertones. I have assumed witnessing each of you city council members and mayor approve the Washna policy that a Black Lives Matter policy is a public health crisis, which would also mean that recognizing discrimination would be an operational priority. I recognize that ordinance on FTRs is not in any means the largest issue in the path to ensuring equality, but as this ordinance is written currently, it is essentially a form of redlining. A high percentage of the guests at STRs are people of color. By limiting STRs to certain areas of Ann Arbor, you are denying access to our city. Comments were also previously made that guests can, quote, just stay in a hotel, end quote. In 2015, data show that there were more than 2 million listings offered on Airbnb nationally, which is nearly four times as many rooms as the Marriott hotel chain. This ordinance would therefore reduce the availability of places for future guests to stay and also limit the economic support from tourism that our city relies on. Hotels are often more expensive per night than a stay in an STR. Removing more affordable STR options is discriminatory. If this ordinance limiting STRs and banning non-owner occupied STRs is an issue you would vote to support in your own town, I would then assume you would also choose to never stay at a non-owner occupied STR because otherwise this is hypocritical and creates a not in my backyard situation, which again is discriminatory. I wholeheartedly support the initiative to create more affordable housing in the city. I also strongly support ordinances that ensure the, quote, health, safety, and welfare by reaffirming police, fire, and building safety guidelines, end quote. I question how the current STRs, which make up 0.2% of the housing market, are contributing to these issues. I see a more reasonable approach to ensure that the city is not taking 
not taken over by outside investors would be to set limits on the number of STRs. Additionally, having residences undergo regular inspections and requiring licensing for the use of STRs to ensure housing is meeting all city codes. I've been a renter of a number of homes in Ann Arbor, which did not meet code. Making an seconds. assumption that if a resident is living in a home, it would, not, it would be safe does not actually protect any future guests. I also think it is important to create strict policies to remove licenses from STR owners who violate health and safety standards or are found to be a credible nuisance to their neighbors. If the true purpose of this ordinance is to protect the health, safety, and wellness of Ann Arbor residents and the guests of the city, you and the city staff need to review how this ordinance is written as currently discriminatory and find more appropriate ways to enforce such a policy. Time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 644. Hi, caller 644, you have three minutes. Yes, that's me. Hello, this is, this is Beth Corey. I'm someone who moved to Ann Arbor to make a career serving as a concierge. This is my full-time job that I'm now in jeopardy of losing. We serve medical patients, students, parents, a lot and business people. During the shutdown, we provided housing for many essential medical workers who were very grateful to us. I'm confused as to why the city council thinks our service to all of these people is a bad thing. We're providing a real need for our customers who return to us time and again because of the great relationships that we've built with them. In closing, all I can ask is to please move to send this ordinance back to city staff for the purpose of exempting legally operating non-resident short-term rental properties from this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Caller ending with the numbers 900, phone number 900. Hi, Adam Hughes, 1328 White Street. Superimposing this ordinance on property owners who have been legally operating in the short-term rental model is a direct violation of our property rights. In past meetings, this council has brought to light their concern for keeping up the character of our neighborhoods. But isn't that what makes our neighborhoods so great? The fact that the municipality cannot control every single aspect of them? Regulate them, sure, but control them, no. Imagine I'm a restaurant owner and I follow all the rules and go through all the right steps to set up my restaurant. Things get off the ground, hummus is flying off the shelf, and then the local municipality gets involved and attempts to dictate what kinds of food I can serve and what I can't. Certain types of food that support the character of the neighborhood are all right, but other types of food that don't are not. This would be a little bit ridiculous, right? I really don't see that big of a difference when measuring it against this proposed ordinance. Perhaps it would make sense for the municipality to put to publish legislation to the tune of no longer allowing a certain kind of food to be served to the public. But where does this leave the pre-existing restaurants that have built teams and business models and made investments to support this, this type of newly outlawed food? This ordinance is an absolute overreach of power and is an infringement on freedom of choice. As a collective, the short-term rental owners in this town have gone above and beyond to attempt to work with and not against the city help develop a certain process so that everyone can be comfortable that property owners are playing by the rules and that neighbors aren't being bothered by short-term rentals. City staff, namely Mr. Delacorte, claims that they don't see what else could be accomplished by going back to the public to figure this out. They claim they've spoken with everyone possible about this issue. That may be true, but speaking with people versus sitting down and actually taking a collaborative swing at problem solving are two different things. Have you gone through the motions and listened? Perhaps. But have you really dug in and attempted to find middle ground? Absolutely not. I empathize with your position. I'm not trying to act like this is an easy task or something that can happen completely pain-free. But you chose a career to be a public servant. You chose to work for the city of Ann Arbor and to help develop legislations to help enhance the city for everyone. On this attempt, you and your constituents have failed the people of Ann Arbor greatly. At the very least, I urge the council to please move to send this ordinance back to city staff for the purpose of exempting legally operating non-resident short-term rental property owners from this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Caller ending 
Phone number ending in 107. Caller 107, you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm a renter in the you know, Fifth Ward. Um, and I just kind of want to talk to this point again that only people uh, who are using this as like a second investment opportunity are affected. Um, I've spent the last two and a half years building up a small STR management business, helping with guest communication, cleaning, maintenance, kind of all the small components that are involved. And um, I'm speaking for myself, our three part-time cleaners and our one part-time handyman. And if you pass this ordinance um, in its current form, basically overnight, you'll be destroying the livelihood for all of us. So there are, um, yeah, a lot of people who, this isn't just in terms of uh, switching to an investment, from investment to investment, but are actually the livelihoods of, uh, that they're basing, that they're living off of. So, um, and I think there's this misconception. A few people earlier have kind of talked to this point that um, you can simply switch an STR to a long-term rental. Um, that's just not the case. You, um, yeah, both invest the time and money to make these properties nicer and, and um, benefits to the neighborhood, but uh, also in furniture and in the processes of uh, bringing someone like us on to help you with the cleaning and the maintenance. And those aren't things that just kind of go away um, and then just in pure logistic form, um, you know, Ann Arbor runs on an August to August leasing cycle. So the timing of this couldn't be worse for property owners to have to switch this to a long-term rental. Essentially you're, um, you're running a high risk that you're just going to go unrented for an entire year. And I think that's a pretty unfair thing to put on a property owner. So it's not just a matter of flipping a switch and turning it from a short-term rental to a long-term rental. And that's, um, yeah, people in the industry, I think, really understand that. Um, and so, yeah, again, just wanted to speak to the fact that when we started, when I started working on this business, I did some research before diving into it and found that there was no rules on the books about short-term rentals that would make it illegal. And overnight, uh, the council is basically saying, uh, yeah, what you've been doing is illegal and we're, 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 uh, we're going to shut you down. So uh, I would just ask that the council consider this non-conforming status um, that, yeah, they take into account the hard work of both the investors, seconds. but also the people on the ground, the maintenance people, the cleaners, the people helping with guest communication and all of people who are going to be seriously affected by this if it goes through in its current form again like two and a half years of, um, yeah, somebody mentioned earlier, like blood, sweat, and tears kind of going into this. And uh, yeah, it's all kind of going out the window overnight if it passes in this current form. But yeah, um, I'd just like to end by thanking the council for considering um, an exemption for existing short-term rentals and um, ask that they send this back for non-conforming use status. That's all. Time. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 369. Hi, um, my name is Shannon Hadamaki. I've spoken to council about this issue before back in January about an experience with a short-term rental in my neighborhood where the guest there um, sexually assaulted me. Um, afterwards, I was um, basically attacked online by a lot of these short-term rental owners as a money grubber, even though I've never filed a civil suit or even approached a lawyer about the incident, a liar, and someone who was bad for women because it was just an ass slap and I should get over it, not call myself a victim. Please note I'm not scared of these individuals and I will never stop speaking out about sexual assault and misogyny where I see it or experience it. So now that I'm hearing that they, these same people who try to tarnish me and my family and my reputation are trying to get special privileges to get their short-term rentals through some sort of loophole to be grandfathered in, I'm very upset. Um, this is the epitome of the concierge council service that was so roundly rejected by the Ann Arbor citizens on Tuesday's election um, by letting a select few loudest voices in the rooms get their voices heard above all that is good for the entirety of the city. I agree completely with Zachary that there is a huge need for housing in our area and these people who have multiple houses, multiple apartments that they are using just for tourists. Uh, it just makes me angry, quite frankly. Um, there are people who are being evicted, 
and we don't have space for our essential workers here. This is an asset that can that can be switched over to a long-term rental that can be sold. It is not an undue financial burden. These regulations have been going up in New York, in San Francisco. If you invested in this business model and you were surprised by the city putting in these regulations, then I'm sorry that you were not smart enough to see the writing on the wall. Um, I'm just very disappointed that they are even trying to bully and get their way by threatening legal action because this is this is not okay. They bully online. They they bully in the meetings. They they're trying to make arguments that we should take it back to the public and do all that. I was at those library meetings where I was routinely over talked and could not get my voice heard. Every time, the only time I've had my voice heard is when I've had to make an effort to call into council. So please do listen to your staff and pass the ordinance as they laid it out and do something, even if it's seconds. not going to solve every problem for affordable housing in Ann Arbor. This will this will help some people lower prices. My neighborhood, we have a short in our neighborhood that was up for sale for at one point for eight hundred thousand dollars. I paid less than half of that for my house seven years ago. It is insane how much prices have gone up. I, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 556. Caller 556. Hi, Ralph McKee, 1116 Red Oak. Uh, since I've been critical of planning staff on other matters, I, I wanted to start out by saying the draft ordinance is well thought out and well written. Job well done. I sent an email today in support. Uh, in terms of the substance, it's pretty simple. We do have an affordable housing crisis and every single STR is one less house on the rental or sale market. There are dozens or hundreds of them. I believe that there are some corporate rent, short-term rentals that aren't in the 120 number that I've heard of several times tonight. So I think the number might be quite a bit bigger. For those of you have, who have supported uh, affordable housing on council, it's inconceivable to me that any of you would not support this. The numbers here might be more than you'll gain if the millage passes in the first year or two. And I'm pretty surprised not hearing from the usual cadre of affordable housing advocates. Uh, this is as important as many other affordable housing issues, and we've not heard from any of them tonight. Yet here's a program that it, it will, at a minimum, stop erosion of our housing stock and likely obtain the return of many units. And where are they? Silence is deafening. Let's talk about the legal issues. I'm not a maven in this arena, but I did a little homework in my email that I sent today described that. First, it, it's very important to separate out the questions of whether to enact the ordinance and whether to grandfather people in. Those are related questions, but they're separate choices. If you ban new non-PR STRs and grandfather the old ones in, you're capping the number and by the way, you're giving the current operators a complete minority, a cash cow, essentially. If you don't grandfather them in, you could potentially be adding units back into the housing stock. I read the letter from the Honigman Miller lawyer for the STR owners, and I heard the other arguments made tonight. I have a lot of respect for that firm. I used to work there years ago. But they have to deal with the same case law that's there like anyone else. There's two arguments. The first is the city's, uh, that they're arguing that the, that the city's failure to enforce the old ordinance plus whatever regulation or, or registration process is going now results automatically in a legal con non-conforming use. The letter focuses mainly on that. However, in the case that they cited, Room, the township, in that case, the township official actually told them that, that owner STRs were okay and then the, they ruled for the township. The, the second argument is really a function of whether they're legal under the current ordinance, not the fact that the ordinance has been not enforced. That's a more complicated issue. Your, your city uh, attorney should look at that hard. You could enact this ordinance and decide 45 days later or some other time about how, whether or not to grandfather them in. You don't have to decide that tonight. You can study it and negotiate with them later Fine. after enacting the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone else who would like to speak at this public hearing, please en enter star nine on your keypad.
Caller with the number ending in 660. Hello, my name is Rue Needler, and I want to thank um, the council for uh, allowing me the opportunity to voice my opinion. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this. Um, I'm calling to support the non-owner occupied STR owners. Uh, I live across the street from what used to be an eyesore for years on my street. And um, somebody bought it and uh, fixed it up. It's a Airbnb, and um, it is now the nicest place on the block. And so, um, you know, they pay city taxes, and um, the person previously who owned it lost the house because they couldn't pay their taxes. And um, I pay my city taxes, and I appreciate people who keep up their home, who um, pay their taxes especially when Pfizer moved out and we all need city taxes, right? We all need people who are paying their taxes. So um, I, I understand that there are quite a few of the non-owner occupied STR owners who purchased homes just like the one that was, used to be across my street and uh, across from my house on my street. And um, there probably are quite a few people like me who now live across from a beautiful home and um, a taxpayer is uh, is there now, and uh, so I I really appreciate that. Um, I do also support affordable housing, and um, but I I think that penalizing people who improve the neighborhood flavor is I don't know however you guys are calling it, but people who are are improving and, you know, upkeeping their, or keeping up their homes and whether they rent them out or not. But this gentleman across from me rents it out. We have never, ever, ever, ever had a problem with um, his renters. As a matter of fact, we didn't even know he was an Airbnb owner. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, the, the people who, you know, now we realize, oh, okay, people are coming and going. We just thought they were his friends. But no, they're renters and they're quiet. They go about their business. Um, we've never had a problem. So um, I just, I want to support the people who, um, who are abiding by the law and who are improving our city and, and making um, um, an seconds. affordable way of um, coming here with families who need to, uh, who have... Um, uh, they might have a, a family member dying and they need to be in a home where there is privacy to handle that. Or they might be go undergoing treatment at, at, at um, area hospitals. Anyway, I support them. I um, urge you to send this back for um, to um, do an amendment that would allow for grandfathering um, uh, at least the people who are already doing non-owner occupied as care owners. Thank you very much. Bye. Time. Thank you. Next caller is Anna Foster. Hi, um, my name is Anna Foster. I'm a resident of Ward 5. Um, I heard a call out a few callers ago that folks in favor of affordable housing weren't on the line. So I thought I would follow up with that and say that uh, we won't be silent. Here I am. Um, I support PH2 as written. Um, as Zach, who also called in a few calls ago, noted, 120 units added to the market of rental property would be three times what has been added um, since the 2015 report on affordable housing um, in the county uh, was adopted by the city. Um, that's not to say that these units would be converted into what could be considered affordable housing. Um, if I do the math right, if they're renting out for uh, 200 bucks a night over the course of 30 days in a month with some vacancy in there, they're probably making um, incomes on these properties far higher than what would need to be charged for an affordable housing unit. But that's still rental properties available on the market that they could rent at some rate or they could sell to families who want to move into the neighborhood. I think cities across country have seen issues with affordable housing, um, or sorry, issues with Airbnb-like properties. Um, and and I think that Airbnb leveraged a very gray area in sort of uh, the legality of this. And 
I understand people's frustrations, um, but I support the city in tightening up the laws here and making sure that we don't have what happens in other communities where full neighborhoods are priced out um, and certain neighborhoods that could free up and become family rentals double down on short-term rentals, which could happen if um, families were moving out of areas like Birds Park. Um, so affordable housing in favor of PH2. Thank you, Ralph McKee, I'm here. Uh, and thank you, Council. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 539. Hi, am I on? Yes, you're on, sir. All right, I'll, I'll keep this short. Um, I think the bill needs to be sent back. I am a property owner, and I am also a resident of Ann Arbor. Uh, I lived in my home for seven years. Uh, we had to move due to a growing family. I love that house, um, and we want to keep it. We have aging laws. In five to six years, they're going to need to move close to us. I want to keep that house as a short-term rental in the meantime so I can recoup costs until they can move into it. Um, with this new law, I'm in outside the zone, and I won't be able to do that. I heard callers mention long-term rentals or yearly, and simply I walk down the streets in Ann Arbor where the students live, and they trash these houses, beer pong tables, uh, shoes hanging from the wires. Uh, I don't want my house to be that. I don't want to have a rental sign on the front of it. Uh, the law is not taken care of. I'll tell you, when you're a property owner, you have to take good care of these properties. People won't stay there. My lawn is meticulously taken care of. There's shrubs. There's flowers, there's gardens. People will give you bad reviews. You just, you can't compete if you don't do that. So, you know, getting back to some other things, why don't people just stay at hotels? Well, during the COVID crisis, people wanted to stay in houses. They wanted to be separate. They wanted to know they had a clean environment where they're not going to interact with other people. Um, you know, getting back to the lady who had an unfortunate incident, and, you know, I'm sorry that happened to her. That could happen with anybody. It has nothing to do with a short-term renter being in there. Uh, somebody walking down the street could have done it, or somebody staying at a hotel could have done that. Um, you know, so I think this bill really needs to be sent back, or at least give the property owners a grandfather clause. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Caller 488. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, ma'am, thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Lori Gross, and I am part of the group of non-owner-occupied um, short-term rental owners in Ann Arbor. First of all, I'd like to address a couple points that have been brought up. There is no Airbnb money behind our group. We are strictly a grassroots group, and most of us met for the first time at the meetings that council had when they started this whole process in October. I still personally have a hard time understanding why council is focused on short-term rentals, <clears throat> excuse me, versus long-term rentals. So many of us have upgraded our properties and our renters are better vetted than most students. We have inspections, I pay extra taxes. I have, um, there were no rules in place differentiating when I bought my house from any other rental house in the city of Ann Arbor. I've been operating legally, and I too ask council to send this back to staff to create a clause to grandfather in existing properties. I'd also like to address the point about being that those of us who are non-owner occupied short-term rental owners are greedy. I know the property that I bought was in horrible condition when I looked at it. They hadn't had students in there for a year, and I don't think anybody had invested in the property in well over 30 years. I've put a lot of time, a lot of money in there. For those who think that it's all motivated by greed, I'd say it's more motivated by loving to find great houses and restore them back to the shape that they used to be and have people in town who can appreciate it and enjoy it. I know the money that I personally have invested, it will take well over 10 to 15 years to make back just that investment. This was not motivated by greed. It was motivated by my love of Ann Arbor and wanting to have a fun place up there that I can enjoy 
improving for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 828. Hi, my name is Kathy Strachan. I live in Ward 1, and I just have two comments to add. Um, one has to do with in the question and answer document that was um, sent back to staff in term, or to council members in terms of their question. Um, the response to the licensing fee was a quote started about $500. And I'm like really surprised at that because when I checked the registration form for long-term rental, I did not see a fee even listed. And I would like to suggest when this goes back to planning that if there's a registration fee for a rental, whether it's long-term or short-term, it should be the same and it shouldn't be $500. I don't think it's gonna be $500 to add a hundred more houses to your rental stock. And then my second comment, as a council, you all approved a development proposal um, under quote, the old rules, because as council member Lum said, it wouldn't be fair to hold the developer to the new rules when they applied under the old rules. And I think the same process should apply here. These short-term rental owners followed the rules at the time that they started and with the rules that were in place, and now you're planning to retrospectively apply new rules. And it's interesting to me that you would want to be fair to a developer, but isn't it more important to be fair to your own Ann Arbor citizens? Thank you. Thank you. Caller 550. Caller 550, you have three minutes. If your phone number ends in 550, you are on the queue and it is your turn to speak. Five five zero. You can pull that person down, Ms. Beaudry, we'll, uh, we'll see yep. you later. Mayor, that is the last caller with their hand up. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at this public hearing? To speak at public hearing, if you've not yet done so, please enter star nine now, star nine. Caller 101? Yes. Hello, um, I am the owner of Ann Arbor Guest Houses, which is a short-term rental business, all centered around downtown Ann Arbor and serving a niche market of visitors for the U of M and other people. In 2002, I moved my business, which was is Bellanina Day Spa from the 409 building, and I reconfigured the 409 building as a office space and a separate apartment. So it was zone C2 at the time. Um, so uh, since 2002, I have been renting almost 20 years um, and uh, to travelers. And I now have seven locations, although COVID-19 is forcing me to shut down two of them to help stabilize my business and cut my liabilities. So the long story short is um, I have developed these businesses and have sold the spa and I have four commercial leases and commercial zones on Washington Street and in Carytown on 4th Avenue. And at age 68, this is my retirement income. I just can't see starting all over again with another business. Um, I, clearly, I don't live in my rental unit, but I do claim one as home and I receive mail there and I stay there often as my second home. Been here for the last month uh, doing things, trying to get business started again after COVID. I have a business license. I pay use tax, I pay Michigan income tax and I support the Ann Arbor community. 
Um, I'm requesting that city council, mayor, and the administrator review my situation on its merit as a solid business model in support of U of M temporary faculty, U of M parents and alumni, U of M hospital families and tourists coming into Ann Arbor to spend their dollars. If you shut down our businesses that are hurting right now from the COVID shutdown, you are harming well-meaning people who are supporting the economy and creating goodwill in the community. Other STR businesses feel the same way and will be impacted the same. So I ask that you grandfather non-resident short-term rentals and protect, uh, protect my pre-existing rights as an uh, Ann Arbor commercial business. Thank you. Thank you. me. Caller 790. Yes, thank you for letting us speak. Uh, I'm a resident on the Old West side. I live several months of, year, of the year in NR, and I live several months of the year uh, in Arizona. And I wanted to talk a little bit about our renters. We do use Airbnb and VRBO to rent our home out, and I, I'm actually a little bit disheartened to hear some of the negative comments about those platforms. Those platforms actually provide great vetting and uh, require uh, as, as much vetting, if not more, than some of the other uh, direct ways that people rent their homes. But also, as an important uh, note that I want to make, and I do concur with everyone talking about uh, grandfathering and people like myself who've been legally running their home as a rental part-time of the year, as I live there several months of the year, as mentioned, I think grandfathering in is a great solution to um, avoid a lot of back and forth litigation uh, that will come forward if this passes. Additionally, I want to mention some things that um, about my renters. On the weekends, we get renters that are families, families that are in for weddings for the most part during the uh, you know the warm weather months of the year, and families that are in visiting their students during the colder months of the year during the school year. Additionally, I want to mention that because of our location and many other rentals that I know are in the area during the week, most commonly our renters are families with either children going to Mott for a surgery or adults going to the hospital for other treatments. These families, in many cases, cannot afford hotel prices at any time throughout the year in Ann Arbor. Not that the prices are high, but the value at, rent at rental homes like mine are significant. A family of four plus grandparents, six people, maybe a couple friends, eight people that can rent a home for barely the price of one or two hotel rooms that can at max accommodate two to four people. And you can get eight to 10 people in a, in a three, four bedroom home in Ann Arbor. Uh, it is a huge, significant savings. And these people, they're going to stay in other cities, Ypsilanti, Canton, Plymouth, wherever, if, if you get rid of 120 homes. And that will reduce, obviously, uh, restaurant revenue. That will reduce revenue at shops downtown. Um, I know my renters go downtown because it's walkable from my home, and they can go shop there. And I know that they've asked me for recommendations for restaurants for the last three years we've been doing this. So we, I wholeheartedly request that this either get denied and, and completely as is, or that you add a grandfather clause, at least for uh, renters like me who have owned their homes for several years legally, and uh, and follow all the rules. We are not a nuisance. Our neighbors are fine with us. 30 seconds. And we take great care of our property. Thank you very much. Thank you. Caller 550, phone number ending in 550. Hi, caller 550, do you have a comment? Yes. You're a man, you are you are on and it is your turn to speak. Okay, thank you. So I'm a um, homeowner at the fifth ward and I would like to point out like we run an Airbnb to support our family and make um, an arbor living in an arbor affordable and like during this whole process to like um, 
speculate Airbnb, I was like able to meet many Airbnb owners and I figured out like they're mainly women owned properties, minority owned. Most people owning and running Airbnbs are women, black people or Hispanics. And um, I'm really um, shocked that an Arbor keeps on like basically take opportunity away from those minority groups. And this is like a chance. Airbnb provides a chance for us to um, make a living in this town and be able to afford an Arbor. And at, and the city of an Arbor attacking us like that, um, yeah, breaks my heart. So I just would like to urge the council to send this um, um, bill back and um, start supporting the people who own Airbnb. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, there are no more callers with their hands up. I think there's just three on the line who haven't spoken. Do you want me to call on them? Uh, I see caller 114 has now raised their hand. Thank you. Caller 114, go ahead. Thank you, James Rodani Ward 4. Um, I'd just like to say uh, owner occupied short-term renter here. So I live in my house and rent it out. I'm calling against long-term rentals. Three houses on my block have converted into long-term rentals, catering to undergrads. Long-term rentals are buying up much of the property stock in Ann Arbor and driving up housing prices. Long-term rentals do not have incentives to maintain neighborhood integrity or their properties. And there's no greater hell on earth than being stuck living next to undergrads. So ban long-term rentals. Leave these short-term renters alone. Thank you. Thank you. Caller 570. Oh, hi, City Council. This is Matt on Miller Avenue. Thanks for listening. I just wanted to, to state that I think this should not move forward because it doesn't meet its stated legislative purpose. And I think we all have this in front of us. So just to quickly read through it, it says that the city is determined the regulation of short-term rentals is necessary to establish a community standard for the integration of short-term rental units within existing residential neighborhoods. And I think that's where it really breaks apart. It's not integrating. It's actually saying where we can or cannot do this. And also stating that, uh, you know, um, existing businesses can't, can't do this. Um, and I think grandfathering isn't going far enough. I think this has to be rethought. So it really supports the legislative purpose and not disincentivizes people from t taking up this business. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone else who would like to speak at this public hearing who has not spoken, please dial star nine, star nine. Caller 882, did you have a comment? Caller 882, do you have a comment? 882, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Mayor, that was the last caller who hadn't spoken and they did not have their hand raised. All the other callers on the line have already spoken. Is anyone else who'd like to speak at this public hearing? Please dial star nine. Seeing no one, this Public hearing is closed. May I have a motion please to approve the minutes. We have before us the regular session meeting minutes of July 20, 2020. Moved by Councilmember Smith, second by Councilmember Amlawi. Discussion May of- Mayor, yes. Mayor, I'm sorry. We still have one more public hearing. Thank you, my apologies. Public hearing number three, an ordinance to approve Liberty Town Home Site Plan and Development Agreement 2658 West Liberty Street. Is there anyone who would like to speak at this public hearing? Thank you, Ms. Bodger. I don't see any callers on the line for this hearing. Seeing no one, this public hearing is closed. Before I was so properly interrupted, 
We have before us the regular session meeting minutes of July 20, 2020. May I have a motion, please? I believe it's moved by Councilmember Smith, second by Councilmember Onlawi. Discussion of the minutes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The minutes are approved. B1, an ordinance to amend section 1265 of chapter 11, risk fund of title one, the code of the city of Ann Arbor, moved by. Councilmember Ackerman, seconded by Councilmember Nelson. Discussion, please, of B1. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? It is approved. B2, an ordinance to amend Chapter 7, Business and Trades of the Code of the City of Ann Arbor by and adding a new chapter, which shall be designated as Chapter 97, Short Term Rentals. Moved by Councilmember Ackerman, seconded by Councilmember Nelson. Discussion, please, of B2. Uh, sorry. Um, we received uh, some advice that perhaps a postponement would be necessary. I don't want to have a full conversation if there is any at this time. I think we had some robust conversation at our last meeting, but if there's useful advice to gain in the last two weeks, I'm open to that. Um, just wanted to address that on the front end before we dove into further deliberation. Uh, before we, if there's any, if someone does make a motion to postpone, I understand that there is some recommend, there is at least one recommended edit by staff, and perhaps that gets moved and I assume adopted by uh, acclamation uh, in advance of that postponement. Councilmember Smith. Uh, I've, I've sent, uh, Jackie, I've sent a, an amendment, the amendment that you were referring to. Mayor Taylor, uh, could you distribute that to council and, and I will read the amendment. Uh, it strikes the um, uh, language about maintaining neighborhood and community character. Uh, so hopefully we can do that uh, quickly, uh, but I just wanted to move that out for the body to consider. Is there a second? Seconded by Council Member Nelson. Uh, Nelson, discussion of the amendment. Is that friendly to the body? Can we take them separately? Separately. We are. This is just on the language. This is just on the uh, section, the legislative purpose, section six, seven, oh, six. Oh, yes. Is that correct, Council Member Smith? It's oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple of people on the queue. I've got Smith, Hanner, and Lum. Um, is the change to 650 friendly to the body? Just want to confirm something. Sure, I guess uh, can, I got Hainer then Lum on the queue. Well, I, I would just I would just wanted to comment on this. I I understand where people are coming from on this. Um, th th this language, um, this notion of neighborhood character that's been it's been very charged. Uh, two words all of a sudden. Um, but, you know, in doing research for this um, resolution, I went to the Michigan Municipal League and in their March, April issue, they talk about common objectives of SKR policies. And one is to preserve affordable housing, maintain neighborhood character, provide safety for residents, visitors, so on, so on. So even the MMLG is in this kind of language. And so I, I, I get it. We can take it out of ours because that's, that's them. It's not us. But it's not that this language doesn't have a use. Um, it doesn't have a purpose. It does have a purpose, and there's a, uh, you know, it, it, it's broadly used. I just wanted to point that out. Councilmember Lum. I think it's a good point, Councilmember Hayner. And I just want to confirm uh, what's being deleted is consistent with uh, with the language that Mr. Delacourt sent us, uh, striking out the words and inserting in the city. In it, its is, place. it is exactly the language Mr. Delacourt sent. Okay, thank you. Oh, here it's here. Further discussion of the amendment? Is it friendly to the body? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Friendly. Further discussion of the main motion as amended. Councilmember Hayner. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to make a few comments on this. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't really uh, wholly supported this as it's come forward through this body. Um, I, I just have some problems with the effects of it, not so much the language. Um, 
it, it, it seems to me when we, we talk about long-term rentals and short-term rentals um, and rentals in general, you know, we're, we're prohibited from discriminating by tenant type. And I, I wonder how much that, that um, prohibition applies to the length of rental as defined as a tenant type. It's still a person renting a property. It's still a person laying their head on a bed at night, you know? And so I, I have, that's one of my concerns about adopting this. Um, I, I think that these wouldn't exist. They wouldn't have a place in our community if there wasn't a demand for them. And I think that we have kind of failed to determine what is a healthy balance of these types of properties in our community. And instead of, I would suggest that instead of uh, defining where they can exist, we may also want to define uh, how many or in what ratio as our housing uh, supply rises and falls and hopefully rises. Um, you know, we, we have neighbors here in the first ward who have uh, reached out to me about this, who have converted long-term rentals to short-term rentals to the benefit of the neighbors of that parcel, uh, to the users of that parcel, and, um, um, you know, possibly also also to the owners of that property, but they are not owner-occupied, but um, they, they regaled me with tales of, of how uh, thankful everybody was to have an opportunity like this. So I think that, I think that these are these are important, and I think I think we're slightly missing the mark with this legislation that's before us. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. I, um, I I I agree with many of the callers and many of the people that have written us that um, long-term rentals, uh, from a nuisance standpoint, easily provide as much of a, a problem or difficulty for the neighbors as the short-term rentals do, and and likely more so by volume and by numbers. So. I'm just again. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of this legislation before us. I think it goes too far. I understand that rules change in business, and uh, all your investments don't always work out. But I, I think. I think we're being a little arbitrary. We're shutting the door on these non-owner occupied in, in these certain areas, and so I, I'm not. I'm not going to support this. I. Uh, I just. It, it's. It's not for me. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Yeah. Uh, you know. I. I think that we are very close to finding uh, a middle ground uh, on this. I, I do think that there is the ability to do this without inflicting uh, maximum damage on some folks that have made significant investments. Um, you know, so I, I'm going to propose uh, that we postpone this uh, until the first uh, the first meeting in September to give staff an opportunity to craft some language about what that exception uh, would be uh, and for us to, to consider that. So I'm going to throw that out there. Is there a second? Second by council members Hainer. Discussion of the postponement. Uh, okay, I've got Ramlawi and Lum on the queue, but I'm going to clear that. You're on the main motion if we get back there. Actually, I had a question. That's why I had raised my hand. Sorry, let's go with Councilmember Lum, then Ramlawi on the on the postponement. Councilmember Lum. Just a clarifying question. Uh, um, and this relates to some of the statements made in uh, the public hearing by various folks. Um, the, you know, there are references to city sanctions, short-term rentals, uh, quote unquote pre-existing rights. Um, would you know it? This is I speak, my cat is starting to speak. I apologize. Uh, that um, that short-term rentals were, you know, were previously authorized, that there were these old set of rules. Um, and yet it's my understanding that the city's ordinances and definitions um, do not permit them, which is why we have this proposal, of course. Um, Mr. McDonald, could you clear the air on, you know, these are, that these were sanctioned that, yeah. And, and we also have threatened lawsuits. So uh, do what you can in answering my question. If you prefer not to answer it, cut it. McDonald? Um, you know, I, I will prefer to keep my my um, advice in writing, but I will say this, and, and I think um, 
uh, you know, certainly, um, certainly Mr. Delacorte or Mr. Leonard can provide more information about this, but what some of the members of the public refer to is registration. And I think what they were talking about is um, the city does have uh, in its housing code, chapter 105, um, a, uh, it, it does have the, the, the uh, requirement for inspection uh, for rental units. It does not specify whether those rental units are short-term rental units or, or long-term, but I think what the owners were talking about is that they had registered or gone through the, the process of having their rental units inspected by the city. And so um, I know you had asked a question about, you know, whether there was a list of short-term rentals, um, you know, that had been sanctioned by the city. It's really just a list of, uh, of those people who had gone through the rental inspection process. But I certainly will, um, will look to Mr. Delacorte or Mr. Leonard if they have anything else to add to that description. Yeah. And while I'm here just on postponing uh, and Mr. McDonald again, if you want to chime in on this, I mean, I, um, I, 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 I am supportive of, of the short-term rental ordinance. Uh, it is now proposed, but I, um, it, I, would the attorney's office benefit from a bit more time? Uh, I mean, if so, obviously that's fine uh, to address some of the concerns that are and questions that are being raised. Um, I believe that the motion on the floor was for the first meeting in September. September. Um, we, we certainly could provide advice before that time. Okay. If council, I, I will say this though, if there's, um, if, if there are other things that council wants to, to us to do with the ordinance or address it, um, you know, we'll use the time that's available uh, to, to, to respond to all of the council questions and concerns. Um, but, but again, I, I will also listen to, to other staff about that particular issue. Thank you. Councilman Romley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't necessarily support a postponement. Um, I, I think the, the intent of that would, would, would only be to carve out winners in this, um, short-term rental game based on those who were opportunistic enough to get in early uh, to take advantage of the loopholes uh, in, in local ordinances. Um, uh, I would only support it if the main motion doesn't have support in going forward. Um, but I don't think that's a good um, I don't think that's a good form of government. Um, I can understand grandfathering things in and in cases where we were changing the rules of the game, but um, we're just addressing shortcomings uh, that were not addressed before uh, and a new type of business model that has come on lately. Um, so I, I, I don't support it based on the principles of picking winners and losers and, and rather having an arbitrary way of doing it. I think this is a, a critical time in, in the economy period. I mean, our GDP shrank by one third in the last quarter, not only short term rentals that are suffering right now, but uh, major parts of our economy. And I think this is a good time to hit the reset button and um, get our house in order before we go forward with a normal economy. And uh, I don't see the market for short-term rentals heating back up anytime soon. And if there's a good opportunity to do the type of legislation that we need to do, it is at a moment like now. And uh, so, I will listen to my colleagues, but I uh, would rather not postpone it because, again, the intent is to um, pick winners and losers. Councilor Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I appreciate 
what Councilmember Romlawi just shared. I, I actually agree with much of what he said, uh, particularly if a postponement is for the purpose of basically picking winners and um, crafting out exceptions for a very small number of people. I'm very uncomfortable with that. And um, I, I think... I think for me, what I think this decision is about is how we see our community function. And it's true that some communities rely significantly on tourism and Airbnbs, our short-term rentals function well in those communities and communities may choose not to regulate them um, because that's the way that their community works. Um, but in Ann Arbor, I feel like we have had, we've had a lot of conversations about how our city can best function where people have access to work and school and in, in within reach so that they don't have to climb in a car. I mean, we heard um, the value of a short-term rental that's within walking distance of our downtown. Well, how much more value would that be to a year-round resident? Um, so I guess I... I, I I will not support a postponement of this because I don't I don't see that we, there's any more information to be gained between now and September. I think we already know that Ann Arbor is a place where community members want to live, work, and go to school and be accessible to things in town. And we we I I suppose we have we have medical tourism, we have tourism related to pe people visiting for college events. But um, we have a hospitality industry. And uh, yeah, I, I will not support this postponement. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bannister. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I think a postponement could be good if the intent during that time period was for uh, the short-term rental non-owner occupied community to work with staff to see if they could create a sensible list of, of um, legal non-conforming exemptions. And I don't feel that's picking winners and losers. I think that that is offering um, possibly legally deserve protection for those business, local business owners who might, as we heard, many of them live down the street or live next door and they invested their savings to do this. Or, and that one guy was doing it short term till his in-law parents could move in. The other guy, you know, was a from the army and so forth. And so they're local people, uh, and I feel that their arguments that they do need some protection for the investments they've already made, that uh, resonated with me. So I, I think a postponement, if it was to, to work on creating the list, and I know staff has said the list is difficult to create, how do you cut it off, but the short-term rental community the many who've talked tonight at the public hearing are willing to use their knowledge and expertise to help uh, make it as easy and quick as possible for staff. They're, they can bring tools that will expedite the process so that it's not as arduous as, as it might first appear. Uh, Councilor Reed. Thank you. I don't support a postponement to um, design uh, an exception for those who um, have been running short-term rentals in uh, residential neighborhoods up to this point. I do, however, uh, support a postponement to get um, clear legal advice on whether or not um, those uses were actually legal um, non-conforming use. And so, um, before we try to carve out an exception for these under that non-conforming use doctrine, I want to know that whether that was a legal use at all. And, and we really haven't touched on that subject yet. And so I, I, um, I um, am going to support this postponement um, 
to get a, a clear idea from our lawyers as to whether or not this was a, a, a legal use of those properties. Councilor Grant. I think Councilmember Ackerman was before me. I saw his hand. His hand was Councilmember Eaton actually said exactly what I wanted to say. Okay, and it was actually pretty close to what I wanted to say. I, I'm going to support the postponement um, to get some legal advice. I just want to make a comment because we heard from a lot of um, people in the community and, and you know, part of me questions, like when we finally got this ordinance back, like how did we get here? Because I remember, I feel like the reason for why we started this is very different than where we are now. And... You know, I appreciate the conversations around around housing and, and what kind of housing this is taking off the market. And I also appreciate the conversations around some of the benefits for people who do visit our community and where what's available to them doesn't work, especially um, considering that we do have one of the, you know, highest ranking medical centers where a lot of specialty care does take place. I don't. I don't want to call them medical tourists. I think there are people who come and 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 sometimes need to be in a in a clean space or or with families. And and so I do appreciate that there's some um, you know really beneficial uses for short term rentals. And um, but but I do want to comment that certainly not all because we heard from a lot of people who called in, but. But if you're going to be pejorative towards renters and towards students and towards people who do want to um, be able to live and work in our community, I don't necessarily think that, that if it went to a long-term rental, it would become affordable housing. But, um, but to use that kind of rhetoric honestly makes me not want to help you very much. So... Um, so in the, as if we do end up with a postponement and we move forward, I would appreciate if we could try to not pit long-term renters against short-term renters and try to, um, to just appreciate that, that long-term renters are, are, are also great neighbors. The discussion, Councilor Malone. Thank you. Uh, I, so in listening to the discussion, uh, you can see you're going back and forth. Lots of good points are being made. Uh, but uh, because I think, yeah, I, basically I agree in, with uh, with uh, what council member Eaton articulated. I, um, I, I, I do not support postponement to um, grandfather uh, existing uh, short-term rentals. Um, and we are allowing, um, we are not prohibiting non-owner um, occupied rentals uh, that are utilized for less than 30 days. It's, we're not preventing them from utilizing their asset. They can still um, rent the property. Um, and, but I, I, um, I do think, too, that we need to remember that every grandfathered unit is, is one less unit of permanent housing. And so I do not support postponing to, um, to, to further explore uh, allowing existing non-owner occupied units um, to uh, be grandfathered as now not proposed. But I do think uh, we would benefit from uh, giving the attorney's office a bit more time uh, to provide the necessary legal advice. So I will be supporting postponement. Councilor Smith. I'm good. Uh, I'm gonna support the postponement as well. Um, you know, I'm a, perhaps a little bit more up in the air with my colleagues on the question of, uh, on the question of grandfathering. Um, you know, when we, uh, when we had medical marijuana dispensaries uh, crop up, they were of questionable legal um, position, uh, and but they provided a service uh, that um, that folks within the community and people from folks without the community valued. Um, and over the course of time, uh, I think we came to the conclusion that, at least with respect to that service, you know, service offering uh, a cap. Uh, it was reasonable and that it was reasonable to honor 
the first move uh, to recognize the fact that there were first movers who had made some investment. Um, seems to me that you know that that situation kind of rhymes here. Uh, you know, we I think none of us want a great proliferation of STRs. Um, you know, we view those you know, that that would be I think understandably uh, undesirable. At the same time, you know, all acknowledge that. You know, the market does like the market values them. Uh, they do serve a role both for people that live here and people that don't. Uh, and you know, I think it's true that people have made investments and you know I, I'm convinced by the number of folks that have come here uh, today that you know while there may be no well big Co may have come in in some cases, we certainly have uh, lots of local folks who have made investments down the street. Um, I don't think it's a, you know a grandfathered environment would be a perfect one, um, but I wonder whether it might be the best. In any event, uh, I'll take I'll support a postponement to hear more from the attorneys and to think more about this. Further discussion postponement. Uh, I think I heard some dispute about it, so let's go with a roll call vote. Who's uh, who's on point today, Ms. Beaudry? Are you, Mayor? Mayor, you are. Roll call vote. <laughs> Starting with me. Okay, uh, Mayor Taylor. On the oh. postponement. Yes. Councilmember Eaton. Yes. Councilmember Nelson. No. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Romlawi. No. Councilmember Hayner. Yes. Councilmember Bannister. Yes. Councilmember Griswold. Yes. Councilmember Lum. Yes. Councilmember Grand. Yes. Councilmember Ackerman? No. Motion carries. 927, let's take a short break. Let us reconvene, please, at 940.
We are back after a short break. DC one resolution to order election and to determine ballot question for charter amendment to allow ranked choice voting moved by council member Grand seconded by council member Smith. Discussion please of DC one. Council member Grand. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the, the many um, advocates in the community who've been working long and hard um, in our community across the state to um, help us come up with language that would enable us to have ranked choice voting. Um, I also just want to address a few of the concerns um, up front that I've heard about ranked choice voting. Um, the main concern I've heard from my colleagues is that they only want ranked choice voting if it is going to be nonpartisan. And to me, those are two totally separate issues, um, both legally and um, in principle. So first legally, um, I've heard from many people in the community who suggested that we have a combination um, ballot uh, initiative that would have both nonpartisan and ranked choice voting in the same place. We can't do that because nonpartisan is a separate charter issue. Um, secondly, um, with nonpartisan, I still do see that there are a lot of trade-offs. I think we really did see um, that our community values that information in this last election and moving to nonpartisan has other downsides like moving um, moving mayor and council races down ballot where there would be lower participation. With ranked choice voting, um, every person that I've really talked to is just enthusiastic about ranked choice voting. It increases participation. It feels more democratic. It enables voters to have um, a say not only in who their first choice is, but also um, if there are multiple candidates to, to be able to have a say um, in their second choice. It encourages consensus. And it's thought to um, build alliances instead of um, making campaigns more confrontational. So that, um, as we heard from Michelle Hughes earlier today, who called in, that instead of trying to keep um, people from participating mm -hmm. in elections, those who are aligned can actually both participate in an election and not spoil um, one another's chances of, of representing what their constituents most value um, and what their voters most value. I also just want to give thanks to um, Matt Thomas, who worked so hard on this from the attorney's office um, in getting this to us in time, uh, right on the heels of working on the affordable um, housing millage <laughs> language and was able, once he was done with that, to, um, to give this some intention. So I also do apologize for the lateness of this, although um, I guess not as late as we're meeting about nonpartisan on, on Monday, which is even later. Um, I have just a couple days notice. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that that also won't be an impediment. I think it was really, um, the timing was consistent with what I promised. <laughs> so, um, we did have a week as promised that this was, that this was put on our agenda um, and it was long notice before that. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, uh, very glad to be uh, Part of bringing uh, bringing this proposal before council and hopefully before the voters, um, you know, I think that we are uh, we're often um, tasked with how to uh, how to open up and bring uh, bring more information to voters uh, to enable voters to express themselves. I think right right choice voting provides uh, you know multiple avenues of expression, multiple avenues uh, of entry to the ballot. Um, minority parties. Uh, would have an opportunity to at least participate uh, in a way that was, um, you know, with, you know, hopefully, you know, during, uh, be fruitful and expand, uh, and, you know, and, and and expand the scope of uh, of political discourse to uh, to you know alter the Overton window. Um, you know, I think that ranked choice voting at the same time uh, recognizes the fact that party labels uh, do carry with them meaningful value, meaningful information uh, for voters, and honors that. Uh, that principle as well. Um, I think that you know, if you talk to political scientists up and down the line, they'll say that you know, ranked choice voting voting is a preferred uh, way of doing business. Um, I think it's uh, it's the right thing to do. It's a smart thing to do. I think it expands 
uh, participation and expands options for Ann Arbor voters, um, while at the same time uh, ensuring that they, uh, that they have the information they need uh, to make a wise choice. Uh, I, I hope that we'll be able to bring it forward today. Councilmember Ramlawi. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. And and thanks for the sponsors and bringing us for a discussion. Um, I, I do share some of the concerns that Council Member Grant has has raised that some of us have with this, um, with with partisan elections. Um, you know, if, if we're uh, a community that most communities in Michigan operate under nonpartisan elections, we're only one of three in the state of Michigan to continue to have partisan elections. Um, it, I don't think it achieves the goals that have been laid out uh, just now by the mayor and and by council member grand i i don't think that this will um, increase participation or inclusivity or bring more people under the umbrella in fact i think it would have the exact opposite effect i think uh it'll continue the path that we've been on recently and that's the consolidation of power um, consolidation of power in a two-party system, but in a one-party town. Uh, we, ha we have lost our ability in this community to have uh, independent-minded uh, folks to participate in civil government. Uh, we got rid of the odd year election cycle. The odd year election cycle gave independent <clears throat> candidates an opportunity to um, have a shot at winning and, and having a seat at this table. Uh, that has been eliminated uh, by going to rank choice voting for local offices uh, using a partisan system, I think will lead us ultimately to a local um, oligarchy. Uh, only folks who have tremendous wealth and connection and power and opportunity will actually be able to game the system and gain seats and represent the city of Ann Arbor. I could support this if we had nonpartisan elections. I support it <coughs> uh, in, that, in that way. But the way I understand it, this would result in someone having to run effectively two campaigns, well over six months of their time committed in order to uh, sit and be a part uh, <clears throat> and have this opportunity that we share uh, tonight. And I really do think if this was to happen, if it was allowed to happen with a partisan system in a one party town, it leads us to an oligarchy. And I'll reserve my comments, uh, <clears throat> my second time to comment later. Thank you. Councilor Reed. Thank you. I support ranked choice voting. Um, but as the resolution acknowledges, state law doesn't currently permit ranked choice voting. There are currently some bills pending in the legislature to allow ranked choice voting, House Bill 5281 and House Bill 5282. HB 5281 would allow ranked choice voting when the election of city's officers is the only election on the ballot. So for example, the ballot we had on Tuesday could not have been subject to ranked choice voting under the proposed uh, legislation currently um, pending in our legislature because it had state and federal offices on the same ballot. Our state election law expresses a preference for local elections to be in odd numbered years so that they don't commingle with state and federal elections. And so there's this acknowledge, acknowledgement that a local 
election in an odd numbered year would be much better operated under uh, ranked choice voting, where it's under our current system in even numbered years, it would not be permitted. Um, I, I, I support ranked choice voting, but because of the mess that we've made of our lo local election laws um, and how we've deviated from the state election law, um, I don't think it's workable. And so I won't be supporting it this evening. Council member Lum. Sorry. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will not be supporting this tonight uh, for various reasons. Uh, ranked choice voting is an election mechanism that one state, uh, Maine, and about 20 cities uh, do now use. Uh, it is something Ann Arbor may want to consider if and when it is allowed in Michigan, which, as others have stated, it is not now uh, permitted um, under Michigan law. Uh, while legislation was introduced in December uh, of 2019 to allow it, the outlook for the legislation is, is unclear and iffy. Uh, I have not decided uh, if I support ranked choice voting or not. I'm doing my due diligence now. Uh, and I would, I would just say, I think there's strong arguments on both sides. Uh, but regardless of that, I just don't think it's at all appropriate uh, to have Ann Arbor residents voting on hypotheticals. Uh, which is what this is. Um, if the enabling legislation is passed and the specific uh, processes, reg regulations, and the requirements are defined, uh, then that's the appropriate time to place the question on the ballot for the voters to decide. Not now before the state even allows it, uh, if it ever does. Um, I would also just note that the ballot language is nothing to, to explain what this is. It just says Ann Arbor should adopt uh, ranked choice voting if the state allows it. What ranked choice voting does not do, however, is address the problem that we have in Ann Arbor uh, that lower turnout August primaries determine who the mayor and council members are. Ranked choice vote voting does not change that. That issue would be addressed, however, with nonpartisan elections where under any circumstances, the higher turnout November general election would be the deciding election. So contrary to what was said previously, um, nonpartisan um, clearly increases participation uh, because the elections would occur in the general election. We will have the opportunity to do that as has been noted on Monday night as we have a special session to discuss placing the question of partisan versus nonpartisan local elections on the November 3rd ballot for the voters to decide. Um, and you will recall that a year ago, uh, seven council members supported allowing voters to decide the partisan, nonpartisan question, but the mayor vetoed giving Ann Arbor voters that opportunity. At that time, council member Smith voted against placing the question on the November 2019 ballot, but indicated he would support placing it on the November 2020 ballot. On Monday, we'll all have that chance. Anyway, the immediate discussion here is on ranked choice voting, and on that, the important point to me is the timing. In my view, we should not be considering this tonight. We should not be placing a hypothetical on the ballot and instead should wait to see if ranked choice voting even becomes legal in Michigan. And if it does, then allow Ann Arbor voters to decide the question. Um, so I won't be supporting this tonight. Um, and one last comment, I think we need to be honest and, and council member Ramlawi certainly uh, touched upon this uh, when he said it's a one party town. Uh, Minority parties cannot participate in our local elections with the new arrangement with four-year terms uh, and uh, even your elections. That's the honest truth. And again, why nonpartisan would move our elections uh, to the higher turnout November general election. And, and that's a huge positive if, if we want to increase participation and opportunities for people. Um, so again, I won't be supporting this tonight and I do appreciate your listening. Thank you. Councilmember Griswold. Um, yes, ranked choice voting is a great intellectual exercise and it seems like a wonderful solution. 
But when you actually implement it, it means having two ballots. We would have two ballots in August and we would have two ballots in November. We would have two ballots during a presidential election. Um, I just think we'd have two ballots being sent out through the absentee ballot process. I, I think that's just way too complicated. Uh, my top priority is to move the election to November. Um, state law requires that school board members be elected in November. I previously served on the school board. It's, it's very similar to serving on city council. City council is no more special. There's no reason why we need to have an August election and a November election. In November, the students are here. I'd like to see November elections. And if we're going to have ranked choice voting, I believe that it needs to be on odd years so that we're not having two ballots sent out when we're having a presidential election. Thank you. Council Member Hainer. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, bo boy, my, uh, my, uh, my colleagues have have spoken well to this issue already, and and some of the language they've used is much more elegant than what I what I was considering saying. Um, <laughs> they uh, the, the, essentially the fact that it's not available at the state level right now, and it, we would need permission to adopt this essentially from the state is reason enough to not not put on the ballot now. The vagaries of the ballot question are are just too much for me. Uh, it's too little for me, is what it really is. Um, and you know, I I I'll share some 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 folks' disappointment that this came late to the late to the game on Friday after written questions were shut off. Um, it didn't really affect it. I've been looking into this for uh, you know about a year and a half now since I've been on council, and some folks in the community asked me to take a look at it. Um, but we do have council rules, and Council Rule Five B describes when things are supposed to be. And some of us like to follow the rules, and 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 obviously we don't always. So I'm not a fan of that. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, what what's I think what we saw in this, one of the things that we saw in this last election, um, and it was stated quite frankly by candidates, that people are going to spend however much money they need to spend to get elected. And what I see, what some people will call campaigns building alliances, while not necessarily a violation of campaign finance law, what some people would call campaigns building alliances, others would potentially I could see that hap what would happen would be that uh, you'd have uh, large money campaigns fronting a series of candidates with the agreement that these three candidates would all share one, uh, one another's uh, rankings. And that would be the word and uh, completely do not rank the fourth person. And it's all too easy to picture that happening after what we saw happen in this in this primary. And so uh, I'm suspicious of the motives for placing on some ballot prior to, prior to it being uh, legal. And uh, I agree with my colleagues that uh, there are equal opportunities for increasing participation in our community and voter turnout by having the elections in November when more people are showing up anyway, when more students are here, which will allow uh, students and and also the, that that uh, that whole population related to the university, which is uh, definitely a part of the fabric of our community, to participate, I think is equally important, and can we can get equal results with that. And so, as I told told folks in responding to the many inquiries, both pro and against, that came to me, uh, I, I I am likely to support a ranked choice voting with nonpartisan elections in November and any other way. I'm I'm really not interested in it right now. I. I see the pitfalls uh, as much as the promise. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Addressing Council Member Lum's comments about my intention, I would suggest that the sponsors of uh, the, the legislation for nonpartisan elections probably should share that with me and have a discussion with me before they assume that I'm gonna uh, be backed into voting the way that they want me to without having seen this legislation well in advance. Second, uh, I, will, uh, I would just throw out that ranked choice uh, voting, uh, particularly in, in races, you've got multiple people running with labels, uh, whether they're democratic socialists, whether they're independents, uh, whether they're progressives, whether they're conservatives, uh, we are no longer voting uh, 
forced to just vote for the, the lesser of the evils that we see, we can rank the people that we want. Um, you know, I think that this, uh, this push comes from the, the voters, not politicians, uh, camp and the work that they've done. It, it's uh, supported by uh, a great deal of academic research. I, I understand, you know, uh, I, I don't think this is a no brainer for me, but I, I will tell you because I think about what the late great uh, Graydon Crapo would say about elections is this is the most fundamental right that, that we have uh, and that we should not alter these things uh, without a great deal of consideration. So that's where I am with that. Thanks. Councilmember Lum. Answer Councilmember Smith's uh, query. Uh, the, uh, the proposal ballot referendum proposal is identical to uh, the proposal that was presented to council on July 1st, 2019. It uh, was sent to the city attorney's office today uh, just to be updated. Basically, it's just a, because it was approved last time, not only by the city attorney's office, but uh, by the um, AG's office uh, before it came to council on July 1st, 2019. And uh, so you will be receiving the exact same proposal, uh, the exact same proposal that you said you would consider for 2020. Um, and um, that's why I just threw that out there. And as soon as the dates are adjusted, I think really that's all the adjustment, uh, but you can just go to Legislar, look up 7119, that's it, or I'll just send you the link. Happy to do that. Um, and I would just say that, um, Well, I think I've said enough. Uh, the, uh, but in, just in general, you know, let's extend opportunities to as many people as possible, both to run for office and to voters to participate. And that only happens in non, in, if we have nonpartisan elections, we're really honest. Uh, and uh, and uh, if we have our elections in November. I, 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 I can't honestly see any rational argument for not saying we want these decisions to occur in the August lower voter turnout primaries versus no, a general election. Uh, how is that not a good thing? <clears throat> Councilor Ramlai. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, just again to echo my colleague's statement, Council Member Lum. Uh, the ballot proposal that we're bringing to discuss and consider on Monday is exactly what we've seen before. Um, there's no new surprises in there, it's just the dates. Um, and you are on record, Council Member Smith, saying that you would support this in a presidential election. And we have one of the biggest presidential elections of our lifetime coming up, so there would be no better opportunity but to pose this question to the voters this uh, November. Uh, this council likes to pride itself on inclusivity and um, let's, let's see it. Let's put this to the voters once and for all. And we tried to do that already, but we've been vetoed. And, uh, you know, I, we asked the voters on a lot of things. And I think this is a, like you just said, the late great um, fourth word, uh, rep that you know voting is a fundamental uh right that we have and and what better way to do is just to go there and ask them themselves and, and settle the argument once and for all it's not gonna be that detrimental and i just think that with what we're talking about here with ranked choice voting is that we're putting the cart before the horse um it's still not permissible at the state level we have uh, very vague language that we're proposing to send to the voters to, to vote on. And I don't think it's a good form of government. And I don't think it achieves the, 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 the goals that are, are described in, in doing uh, such. So, uh, you know, over 30% of voters identify as independent. They don't identify as Democrat or Republican, over 30%. That's a big part of, of our world or of our, of our country, of our community, um, who don't identify with 
party labels. So if we are talking about inclusion and diversity and, and uh, representation of minorities, then let's open it up <laughs> and let's have nonpartisan elections. It's, it's, it's frankly that simple. And what we're seeing now is, is not good for democracy. We're seeing a lot of money being spent. And uh, well over $260,000 was spent on just this primary alone, $260,000. If that's not alarming uh, to the ge general public, um, they're not paying attention. Councilmember Hainer. Uh, it, th thanks, Mr. Mayor. It's gonna sound redundant now. I was gonna thank Councilmember Smith for reminding us of uh, former Councilmember Kripal's concerns over the sanctity of the act of voting and uh, you know, he, um, if I recall correctly, uh, he was in a tight three-way race and he was elected with a plurality and not a majority. Um, he very well may have not served under a uh, ranked choice voting system. And I, I certainly, you know, that, that would have been a shame. And so um, I think we've, we've had, you know, we've had the results we've had within with, both with our historic brief effort at ranked choice voting um, with the Human Rights Party and so on. Um, and, and without it. And I, I think it's time will come, but I don't think that time is now. Thank you. Councilor Nelson. Thank you, Mary. Mayor. Um, I, I, I just want to comment that um, Councilmember Olami brought up a point that I hadn't thought of, which is a significant one, that now that we know just how much money um, can be invested in these kinds of races, the idea of there being two contests, both in August and November, does mean that it you're gonna have to have significant means to make this play out. And I, I just have a lot of concerns with the idea that we are, we're framing the issue of ranked choice voting as opening up all kinds of options, but it all of the candidates are not available on the same ballot. I mean, ranked choice voting would make a whole lot of sense to me if it was simply happening in November and it was just wide open and we were inclusive of students. And I, I'm really, really surprised that I'm not hearing more concerns about how students are cut off in August. And I think we saw a demonstration in March, you know, Jackie's office overwhelmed with ballots and students wanting to participate in the presidential primary. We know that students who are in town want to participate in elections. Mm -hmm. They are energized. And if we had our elections in November, if we had ranked choice voting where it's the one and done in November, I could support that. I, um, I, as far as this being a hypothetical, I, when I read the house bills, I was just, I was just sort of trying to visualize, okay, so we're going to have ranked choice voting in August in the primary and ranked choice voting in November, and they have to be separate ballots. And I, you know, I, it just is, it's its strange to me that we would do this. Um, and I also believe that there would be time, certainly in the next two years to put this on a ballot um, before it, it, in, the, in the eventuality that the state permitted it, if it was already permitted and we knew what the actual state law was going to look like because the house bills that are up now are not necessarily the ones that are eventually going to be passed. Um, so I appreciate my colleagues comments on this issue. I. I do support ranked choice voting. I think it does not make sense in a three-way race for somebody to not to win not having earned over 50% of the vote. That doesn't make any sense. Um, we need to have a solution for that. Um, and I, I really do think that the solution is making sure that there's some kind of choice in November. Um, thank you. Councilor Griswold. Uh, yes, most of what I was going to say has been said already. Um, but it's important to realize that the concept of ranked choice voting is, is very good. I support ranked choice voting, but we can't put it on top of the system that we have in Ann Arbor. And we have to remember that Ann Arbor is one of only three communities in Michigan with August um, primary elections based on party. So when we come in line with the rest of the state of Michigan, 
then I think that we'll be able to implement ranked choice voting. But we, we are not there. And from a practicality standpoint, it just won't work. So thank you. Uh, Councilor Hainer, I believe you've spoken twice already. I had a question for the clerk. Councilor Hainer. Th thank you for indulging this question. Is this correct what I'm hearing, uh, Ms. Beaudry, that ranked choice voting requires a separate ballot? Does it also require a separate tabulation method? I, my understanding was that we were set up for this if need be. Uh, thank you for indulging my question. Our current um, technology that we use to tabulate votes would not, does not allow for ranked choice voting. I understand um, the city of Ferndale has had it in their charter for a number of years, and they're also awaiting a Bureau of Elections decision as well as improved technology um, before they could actually implement it. Would, so, this would this then require a, not just the printing of a new type of ballot, but a new tabulation system and so on? Would we be, it, apply, be able to get state or federal grants for that? It would depend whether the system that we have, whether the vendor um, if there was demand, if they could make software improvements to the existing scanners. It doesn't mean that the scanners couldn't do it. It's just that right now the program we have doesn't um, contemplate that kind of counting. Okay, th thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Hey, hey, Mr. Thomas also looked into this question. He might be able to add something. Yeah, I, I, I did. And that's basically what we found is that, you know, the machines have the, have the technical capability to do it. They just don't have the ability right now to, to, to do it. So I, I, I agree with the clerk. Further discussion? Councilor Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Beaudry, I Forgive me for my ignorance. Uh, in a nonpartisan election in which two or more people are running, is there a primary and then a general? Yes. If you look at like the most recent um, judicial the, race, there were three candidates right. in a nonpartisan election and two will move forward to the general. Okay. So listening to objections raised about ranked choice voting, I'm listening to the cost is too high uh, in terms of the need to, to fund a six month campaign. The toll on individuals is too high in order to run a six month campaign. Uh, there's fear that in a partisan ranked choice voting scenario, we would consolidate power to only those represented by one party or who are willing to run in a certain party's election or primary. You know, I think there is a there's a logical response to each and every one of these, and any of those problems that we raise, nonpartisan elections aren't a snake oil that washes over them. If we have nonpartisan elections, we will, by their nature, very likely have primaries and generals. It'll be the same length, and in fact, we'll probably end up spending more money because the importance of identifying ourselves by our values becomes that much harder without party label. Um, you know, I, I think when, when political scientists discuss electoral systems, there's never, you know, good and bad. There's never perfect. There's level of preference. And that's because electoral systems exist on a spectrum of easily malleable and corruptible to, you know, good and representative um, and true to democracy. And up and down the line, uh, studies of ranked choice voting in action prove that they produce more representative outcomes of the people. Um, and if that's the goal of an election, then let's adopt the system that provides that for us. You know, Ferndale's had this as part of its charter for 10 years because they've eagerly awaited an opportunity to inject more democracy into their system. I don't think it's out of the realm that, that we also try to be a leader in election reform. It's not surprising that all of the activists and advocates and organizers who uh, pushed through the end of gerrymandering in the state of Michigan have turned their attention and focus 
to the implementation of ranked choice voting in the state of Michigan. It's because they represent the same values, true representation, the ability to have conversations in August and November. Um, so that's all I'll say on that. It, it's, uh, that's all I'll say on that. Councilor Griswold. I just wanna point out that Ferndale and the vast majority of the state have nonpartisan elections and we would not be required based on the language that we adopted to have August primaries, even if there were three people uh, who were running for a position, just like the school board, you have the election in November and the top vote getters win. And with ranked choice voting, you would have that extra layer to consider um, the candidates so that the winner did have a majority of the votes. Councilor Lum, I believe you've spoken twice already. Mayor. Ms. Boji. May I clarify, if Please. it's still a partisan election, you would have to determine the candidate for the November ballot in August. Mm -hmm. The law would not allow for multiple Democrats to run in November. Thank you. Mr. Oh, the state, oh I'm sorry. Uh, Th that state question. election law, Ms. Motory, you can only have, uh, under a partisan, you can only have one person from each party in November. So there could be three people on the ballot in November as long as they were from separate parties. But under nonpartisan elections, you could have three people on the ballot with or without ranked choice voting in November. Is that correct? That's correct. Under the partisan law. primary in August is to nominate the candidate for the November ballot. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Grant. Does Councilor Willem want to speak? I mean, she's, I she's already twice. I appreciate your kindness. I, 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 I'll be super quick, like two sentences, if I may. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I just, two points. Um, with nonpartisan, the deciding election would always be in November. Um, if there are two candidates or less, there is no primary. Um, if there are more than two candidates, there's an August primary with the top two on the ballot in November. So November is the deciding election and that's a good thing. And my other point, uh, with the system that we have now, um, running in November, all the candidates are unopposed. That's it, thank you for indulging me. Councilmember Grant. Thank you. Um, I apologize for not providing some other context about the discrepancy between the, the state, the state of this of proposed state law and, and nonpartisan. I was um, encouraged by um, leaders at the state level who have been working with both, as mentioned, voters, not politicians, and now and now working on this issue of ranked choice voting, um, that that it would be incredibly helpful to those trying to push through legislation in Lansing if more communities actually came forward and adopted um, ballots like the one proposed this evening. Um, I was also told by those at the state level that the language, um, I believe as one of my colleagues mentioned earlier, is not set in stone. Um, and so looking at different communities that adopted this, they could change the enabling legislation um, to accommodate all of the communities that have expressed this preference. Um, I do believe that that our community is, is um, you know, intelligent enough to, um, to be able to figure out um, such a hypothetical that if enabling legislation allows it, we wanna move forward. And so all it's doing is preparing um, for that hopeful eventuality. So it's, it's pretty low risk. Um, you know, I think the last two years have shown, um, maybe not from my colleague's perspective, but, but I'm patient the time for ranked choice voting will come. If it doesn't come tonight, I'm disappointed because many of you have expressed that you're in favor of it and it's actually quite separate from nonpartisan. And um, and the idea that there's some sort of quid pro quo, like if you pass nonpartisan, I'll pass ranked choice voting. 
um, is incredibly disappointing to me. Um, the fact that the fact that I've been called dishonest by a number of you here, um, the fact that that many of you have accused um, people who won an election by sizable margins of buying it is also disappointing. Um, and to let your feelings about that color the ability of voters to decide about whether or not they wanna have um, a better form of democracy is, is also disappointing, especially during a presidential election year, because I've often heard from many of you that we should let the voters decide these important decisions. So um, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to hear this feedback. I certainly, um, for the last number of weeks, have been hearing have have offered that if anyone had any questions, please let me know. If anyone wants to co-sponsor this, please let me know. Um, and until the language that I heard from one of you, right? So none of these concerns were expressed when I when I said that my intent was to bring this forward back on our July 20th meeting. Um, so I'm sorry that you're taking out your feelings this way on our voters. Further discussion of the main motion? Roll call vote, please, starting with me. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Councilmember Eaton? No. Councilmember Nelson? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Ramlawi? No. Councilmember Hayner? No. Councilmember Bannister? No. Councilmember Griswold? No. Councilmember Lum? No. Councilmember Grand? Yes. Councilmember Ackerman? Yes. Motion fails. DC2 resolution to extend res resolution R2194 resolution to approve downtown street closures for restaurant and retail use during the time of mandated physical distancing. Moved by Councilmember Smith, seconded by Councilmember Omlawi. Discussion, please, of DC2. Councilmember Griswold. I'm going to support this. I think it's been very successful and very helpful to the financial well being of our businesses downtown as, as much as it possibly can during this pandemic. I do have a couple of questions about um, what the vehicular traffic volume is right now compared to normal. Uh, I know that we heard that the vehicle traffic around town was at 50%, but that was measured the week before the governor listed, lifted the stay home order. And secondly, are there any arrangements being made for home football games? Because I know during home football games, we closed the crosswalks on Ann Arbor Saline Road and put up barricades. So would we leave Main Street closed or what would we do during home football games? And we have to take into consideration uh, that first street is, is mainly closed for construction at this time. Is there any staff response to that? Mayor, I'm not aware that there are traffic counts that are, are going on now in the downtown. Um, I can share anecdotally, uh, you know, I could only share anecdotally that it has not been heavy. Um, in regards to the uh, football planning, the schedule has just come out and it um, surprised me that uh, some of the game, one of the games is now uh, during, uh, before September 21st, it was not, a home game wasn't planned before that before. So I think council can anticipate um, a request for road closure coming up on that. However, this is a fluid year and, and how, how they're gonna proceed with the football games, we still don't know. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, you're asking good questions, but I, I think we don't have the answers to some of them yet. Okay, thanks. Councilor Hainer. Uh, thank you. This, uh, this resolution asks that it last until um, September 21st, 2020. And, you know, as, as you all saw, we received many requests from downtown business owners, owners and uh, others in the community to, you know, extend it as long as possible. So what, is it a simple matter to, should, should we modify this now or is it a simple matter to 
uh, bring this back and say, look, it, it's working out. We still have the COVID concerns. You know, the university has changed or anything that's dynamic about this situation. Well, clearly there are many things that are. Um, and then, and then is, is it a simple matter for us to extend this yet again? Or, or should we just maybe modify it right now and extend it until, you know, October or something? I, I, I don't care either way. I mean, it seems to be working out for people. I, I've had, I've seen more anecdotally, I've seen more c confusion around these uh, temporary street closures for the healthy streets. I can't tell you how many people I've seen start to turn down a street that they thought was a street, see the close sign. And then there's a, now they're parallel to the traffic and they're trying to back their way out. They don't know they can go down the street. And so I know there's some, that, that that's not, that's healthy streets program. Not this. I recognize that, but I, I think that's going to cause more confusion than this. I'm just wondering if we should, if anybody has any opinion on moving to, to make this go even beyond September 21st, just throwing it out. Council there. member, council member on Lally. Thank you, mayor. Um, and thank you to Tom Crawford and council member Lum. Um, we've been meeting with uh, the DDA, the Merchants Associations, uh, every two weeks, every every second or every other Thursday. We've been meeting to assess the situation, the needs, adjust if anything needs adjusting. So um, when we uh, brought this resolution forth, uh, we were cognizant of the, the home football games. And at that time, the first football game was on September 26th. So we, I had asked for this to be uh, a sunset provision of the 21st. So uh, that's the situation uh, periodically as, as we have and be ready to, to pivot, whether it is to um, extend it or at the discretion of the city administrator uh, pull the plug on it if, if things got too uh, too hot and unsafe. Uh, so um, after this was 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 drafted, the the, um, the football games were announced and, and they moved up the dates. And now the first date is on the fifth of September. It's my understanding that there won't be uh, folks in attendance or very few uh, in attendance. So I'm not sure how the other uh, closures, if they're going to happen, will happen because uh, there won't be 110,000 people in that stadium, obviously. And I, I don't know if they're going to be able to play a full season based on what's going on in other sports. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, it's been my um, my train of thought is is to continue to monitor this, continue to work with with uh, Tom Crawford and, and Councilmember Lum, the DDA associations uh, and evaluate the situation every two weeks and make uh, make our decision based on real-time information and to go as far as November 1st right now I think would be um, a big leap of faith and I think it's, it's it's more sensible to take it in increments and in smaller increments we've heard from dozens of small businesses that this has been a huge um, shot to their arm and 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 hopefully will will allow them to make it through this i mean uh, i've talked to many uh folks in the industry and it's no secret you guys know i own a restaurant down here i'm down here every day i have been ever since this pandemic has started i haven't taken much time off here and we closed for three weeks during the late may uh but it's bad down here we don't have the people working downtown we don't have a captive audience our business lunch is shot. Um, catering is shot. Um, I know some some bar owners that are going to be going out of business. They're they're able to stay in business now because of the outdoor seating. But once the weather turns, they're closing down, and many of them uh, are, are contemplating whether they're going to be coming back. And so, you know, uh, I might go beyond three minutes, but I apologize. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of background on this because I have been spending quite a bit of time on this, uh, probably upwards uh, over 50 hours this summer working on this alone. And uh, so uh, what we've been hearing is that, uh, like my business, 85% of, of our sales um, uh, are, my, for, for me, it, it's to go. 
85%. But for other businesses, it's 85% uh, outside. Not very many people are comfortable eating indoors. Um, and uh, so I think this is really important uh, to, to uh, help those who need it the most. And let's not forget what's, what's created downtown success for the last 15, 20 years are its small local businesses, are its restaurants, its coffee shops. That, that's the reason tech companies wanted to relocate in downtown and pay really expensive uh, rents is so that their, their staff, their employees can take advantage of the, the downtown amenities. So um, it's important that we try to protect that because that's what's made our downtown uh, rich and vibrant. And uh, so, uh, you know, we were going to just come back at, and, and look at this in a few weeks and, and see if it needs to be extended. So I apologize for going a little long, but this is important to me and it's something I've been working on for since since uh, since May. Thank you. Councilor Lum. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, well and eloquently put, uh, Council Member uh, And I would like to thank you um, for taking the lead on this. And, um, and I'm happy uh, to be a co-sponsor. Uh, I think, um, you know, as we all know, we all pre fully appreciate that, um, that, that extending the existing uh, street closures that have been in place downtown is supporting business we're in a safe environment of social distancing, and that's a good thing. Um, and when we approved these closures on June 1st, um, at, it was done at the request of the downtown merchant associations who had polled their members. Uh, and at that time, again, as has been stated, we all again appreciate the closures were the end August 23rd, uh, or when the restrictions on um, gatherings were lifted by Governor Whitmer. Um, this extends again, as Councilmember Ramlawi shared. This is, this is these proposals are being brought forward and adjusted uh, a bit through very thoughtful collaborative uh, process that that engages all the merchant association representatives through their executive directors, the DDA, uh, Mr. Crawford, uh, various city staff, and uh, and again as. Councilmember Malawi shared uh, this is being monitored and evaluated every every couple of weeks. Um, so you know it's it's a pretty nimble and very thoughtful process. The uh, so this 30 day extension um, uh, it, again is until the 21st of September or when the restrictions on gatherings are lifted by by the governor. Uh, and it, it does cover the same streets for the same time. From Friday at 2 p.m. through Sunday at 8 p.m., we've um, we've been receiving lots and lots of emails about this in support of this. Uh, some of some folks have suggested because it has been so successful to extend it further, you know, to a Thursday or all week. But again, what's being brought forward reflects the conversations and recommendations. Um, and and on this, the, the merchant associations have asked for the extension. Um, and again, these emails from folks certainly support this. Uh, as we all know, the pandemic has uh, severely impacted our local businesses. Um, and Council Member Ramawi obviously knows and uh, has just explained to us how significant this impact is. And I will just say, uh, Council Member Ramawi, we are so fortunate to have your real world um, voice on this uh, and on so many business issues. Um, so thank you. Uh, so, and this is all about supporting our local businesses, helping facilitate their recovery and frankly, their survival. Um, so obviously I'm fully supportive of this extension and, uh, and I, I, um, and appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Councilman Nelson. Thank you. I, I would like to ask to be added as a co-sponsor. I, I am very, very pleased that we're able to make this happen for the benefit of our downtown businesses. And um, I, I'd just like to add that I, I wanna thank staff for um, the efforts that have been made um, in the public awareness campaign about 
wearing masks downtown because I think that is the flip side of this coin is having allowing the these activities downtown and attracting more people downtown which is something that I think we all want to support to make sure that our businesses survive um, the flip side of that is the responsibility that people need to take when they're walking around on the sidewalks and are getting in close proximity to people we really do need to be um, conscious of how close we are to people and wearing masks and so I I look forward to ongoing city efforts to make sure that that is a reality. And I, I, I'm grateful for the, all the signage that I've seen around town reminding people to wear masks when they are in our downtown where people are tend to be a bit closer to each other. Thank you. Councilman uh, Grant. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, last week I, I heard you know, concerns about, about consistency with masks, about some people not feeling safe downtown. So about a week ago, I was biking with my daughter and I felt like if I felt safe with her going through downtown, that was a pretty good test of, um, of safety. And I know as I've been downtown more often and, and really looking, I do feel like mass compliance is up. Um, I hope that we will be able to evaluate um, after August what it looks like once student move-in comes back because we may want to find that we actually want to do this more days if we have more students on campus we still don't have a good sense of exactly how many of them are coming back or not um and i think we'll have a good sense of of numbers and if it makes sense to have um, more of our streets open to pedestrians and cyclists um, as well as as outdoor eating um, and also we'll have a good sense of of what compliance looks like um, from those who move back into town in the next few weeks. So i um, very pleased to support this and, and I appreciate Councilmember Malawi's perspective as a downtown business owner. Um, Councilmember Malawi. Your work on this. I'm sorry, Councilmember Grant, I, I interrupted you. My apologies. Councilmember Malawi. Thank you and, and thanks to my colleagues for their support in this and it's, 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 uh, uh, it's Deeply appreciated. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that part of the working group that meets every two weeks, uh, often Michael Rain from the University of Michigan uh, joins us to uh, uh, fill us in on what the university is doing. And we've been trying to collaborate, uh, Tom Crawford and others and staff have been trying to collaborate with the university. So we, uh, with the information and, and education campaigns, we are consistent in, in understanding and in sync with each other as to what we're doing and how we're doing it. So uh, I apologize I didn't mention that earlier, but we are in constant contact with the university with Michael Rain uh, to better understand uh, uh, what's going on with, with, uh, with the university and how that impacts us. And uh, it was gonna be this week here, I think the university was gonna have a better idea of how many students were gonna come back to campus this was a, a week that Michael Rain said that it would be uh, shaping up for them in terms of the information that they can uh, uh, relay on to us to see what they expect the population to be like. Uh, but that is a, a big consideration that uh, my colleague just brought up, uh, Council Member Grand, that th the situation is going to change quite a bit when, when school reopens. And we are, you know, not necessarily on pins and needles, but we know it, it's going to change drastically. And hopefully um, it remains safe. Um, and so, again, that's another reason why we, we meet often and we want to revisit this every 30 days to see what the situation is like before um, committing to too much. And I, we understand that, and, and I think everyone does, that the city administrator does have the authority to terminate the program at any time where he feels it becomes unsafe. Uh, but after August 30th or 31st, when the students return, we will have a city within a city and there's gonna be different needs and different uh, risk factors uh, based on what part of the city we're talking about. So um, whether it's for social distancing or to help the small businesses or both, uh, there are a lot of different nuances and each street is being looked at 
uh, based on those unique uh, circumstances. So all those things are being talked about uh, uh, in detail, like I said, every two weeks. And if anyone wants to join that, please reach out to, to Maura or, or Mr. Crawford, I'm sure, uh, uh, if you want to join the conversation uh, on the 30th. Uh, uh, I'm not sure when we're meeting next. I, I apologize, but I think it's next Thursday. Um, more the merrier. Further discussion, let me suggest we've probably talked through this one enough. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? It's approved. DB1, resolution to approve Liberty Townhome Site Plan and Development Agreement 2658 West Liberty Street. Moved by Councilor Smith, seconded by Councilor Ackerman. Discussion, please, of DB1. Councilor Hainer. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just briefly, I, I was sort of shocked by the first uh, uh, the, the first report from planning staff, and and not but not surprised knowing the site well and the area well, um, and I'm not I'm not thrilled with the results that they came that that was come up with between the negotiations of reworking the entryway and so on and stretching kind of the not stretching because it's lawful but uh, in any event stretching the <laughs> stretching the uh, the definition of safe you know, fire access. We actually saw that today down on the lower town site where, uh, you know, they're going to drive right over the roundabouts. They're not going to, they don't, they're too, too tight for our equipment. Um, so, so I have the concerns about traffic and access to this site and I share the ones that staff shared. Um, I, I'm, I, I understand, but not fully how they've been, uh, changed, uh, by limiting access in and out of the site in one direction only. Um, but what was most startling to me in the report was the notion that um, this this is riding a, a much needed um, uh, market rate housing, which we know that market rate housing is needed. But we've had so much built in the last couple of years that's been, uh, you know, I, I know that it's not market rate; it's above market rate. And so um, th that the notion that this is rare market rate housing tells you something about the money that's uh, sitting out there to be skimmed out of our community by people who are willing to build above market rate or or near luxury or luxury uh, uh, versus what we really need, which is workforce and below. And so I appreciate that this is providing that. Um, it's one of those little slots of land, if you know where it's going, that it, it wouldn't be for me. Um, I. But, um, you know, I, I hope that the units that are constructed are in such a way that 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 folks can live that close to the highway. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate that we're, we're, we're uh, the, this this green parcel that is really um, kind of green in name only in this situation is being developed. And, I, you know, my apologies to any neighbors who are going to have constant U-turns in their neighborhoods. But I think it's appropriate that that we approve this uh, with those changes. Um, you know, just to kind of add to our, add to our mix of housing. And uh, uh, to that end, I, I, sometime the next month, we're going to, I want to bring forward a resolution to, to start to do a more complete survey. Mr. Delacourt spoke about this a little bit um, uh, with email today. Uh, I really want to get a record of what, what is gained and what is being gained and what is being lost in our community. Um, both the, the types of housing, the bedrooms, the cost, uh, the acreage and so on, everything about it. I think we should be able to to chart our progress or lack thereof when it comes to uh, the types of housing and the amount of housing that that's going up and coming down in Ann Arbor. I think that's going to be critical uh, information moving forward as we try and tackle these issues that um, kind of un, un, unleashing the development has had on our community. And, and they've been they've been uh, many negative issues have come with that. And so I, I'm going to support this despite the the traffic woes and I, I I pray that nobody gets railed coming out of this community. I, I'm, I'm concerned, but uh, supportive. Thank you. Councilmember Griswold. Uh, yes, I have a couple questions for staff, uh, primarily for the public record because I'm, I'm somewhat confused why we have to have a right turn only coming out of the property and exactly what the site distance problem is. And the last question is, we want to reduce our police citizen interaction. So when we create a barrier to what is 
sort of the default norm behavior and we're not letting people make a left hand turn out when we know they want to go in that direction. Um, it, it troubles me that people are going to break the law and then we're going to have to use enforcement. And I just don't think that's a good option. So my, my first two questions are about the traffic flow out of the property and what's causing the site distance problem and could it be removed? Uh, well, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Brett Leonard, I'm the Planning Manager. We also have Alexis DeLeo, the City Planner, and Cynthia Redinger from Traffic uh, Engineering as well. Um, I will do my best to, to address that question. Um, we, we agree. Um, the circulation of traffic in this in this particular configuration for this site is less than ideal. However, um, that configuration, in our opinion, is necessitated for safety concerns. Um, providing safe access to this site um, warrants that configuration. Um, and uh, the petitioner and working with uh, city staff work to uh, orient that drive and, and relationship with the public road right of way in the best means that we can to um, uh, discourage folks not um, following the, the design direction that we, we assert. By no means, obviously, can I sit here and guarantee that it will never occur, but um, the, the safety concerns specifically with the grade changes of Liberty and the presence of the overpass and the corresponding guardrails and walls associated with that um, really do necessitate from our lens that the right turn out in and out is appropriate because in fact it is, um, it, it's vital to the safety of that function of access to that site. And I don't know if um, Cynthia you or Alexis, you wanna add anything else to that? Um, I can add that the uh, site distance problem is because the site is located on the inside of a slight curve of Liberty and the Liberty also ramps up as it goes over I-94. So um, when seated in a car, it is hard for motorists to look um, um, up enough and around the curve enough. And that's that's what's creating the site distance problem. The and then compounding all of that is the fact that there are um, um, the there are solid walls, parapet walls to the bridge. Mm -hmm. um, so what little sight distance you might have is then blocked by the solid bridge wall. So you, I believe you mentioned, could it be removed? Um, well, uh, I mean, it could <laughs> it could be, but. Um, it requires a full reconstruction of both the bridge over 94 and grade changes for hundreds of yards. And is there any way to move the driveway further to the east? The driveway is as far east on the site Already. as yeah. possible. And our um, development team looked into even acquiring the adjacent site, but it is not for sale. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Amlawi. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I'm concerned as to some of the traffic and, you know, the, the amenities, I believe, if I'm um, thinking of this right, all lie to the east, the shops, downtown. There's going to be a whole lot of traffic that um, would, would go would go east down Liberty to get back to town and to the stores and to things that people would want to get to. And I'm just wondering in the current configuration, folks exiting this would have to go right and then go all the way down to Wagner or how would they head back east uh, towards town um, in reality here? Uh, your your assertions are correct. They would have to leave the site when traveling on a vehicular basis and head west um, and seek some other route to the city. Um, that could be going all the way to Wagner or perhaps through, um, I'm forgetting there's another uh, road there that connects uh, 
down to Sio Church as well. Um, but absolutely, and that is that is a, a balance that you know we we recognize was a difficulty in in making sure this site was compliant with code. But in the end, um, the sort of adverse concerns about the traffic circulation were outweighed in our eyes about making sure those turning movements are physically safe to the greatest extent possible. Um, also, you know, by I, I'm not trying to diminish it, there will be vehicular trips associated with this site, but it's also fortunately also on uh, transit access routes and um, other infrastructure in that area. So um, ideally, some of the challenges of that might um, also uh, help with the mode, sh mode share of trips from that site. But um, you're, you're, you're definitely right. This is a decision of code compliance, emphasizing safety over circulation pattern. Um, I guess, uh, I'll go offline with other concerns on that because I just, I just feel like, uh, people are going to be doing things that are unsafe, uh, in their cars in order to head back East. Um, uh, and, uh, that, that might cause a, a bigger threat than, than what we're trying to, uh, um, achieve in, in addressing. So, um, I just have a question. I know we're running late, but. I, I have a, a concern that I, I've already forwarded to, I think, Derek and the city attorneys on another property that, that is ne near this, where it was recently constructed and now um, things are falling apart. It, you know, the craftsmanship, the workmanship on the development was poor. Uh, people have moved in and they're having all sorts of issues with the, um, with the home that they, they purchased. Um, what's the recourse for, for people that move into these new developments and end up buying lemons? Um, does the city, uh, um, at, and, I, and I guess I can take this offline, but it's a, it's a concern of mine uh, that, that some of these new developments are, are not built uh, very well and they start to fall apart soon after people move in. Um, what kind of recourse is there? Is there any protections that we put in in place and in, in, in a step like this? Yeah, I, it's not something that I could offer um, feedback on. I think that would be something for um, the building department probably specifically. Um, obviously, we as the city um, specify and, and adopt building codes as mandated by the state, um, but I, I couldn't respond to within those codes um, what recourse, if any, would exist. Um, if I could just add very quickly for the council member, um, there is a, a, a difference as um, Mr. Leonard was suggesting. We, our codes uh, really are about compliance with code. And there's very distinct um, difference between that and workmanship. So as long as those buildings are complying with the code, that's really what the city is inspecting. Um, and I, I, make that, I make that differential because certainly when the building inspector goes out, um, it has to be, it has to meet that requirement, but they in general don't look at workmanship, if that makes sense. That's the term that's, that's kind of been used. Um, so the, so the quality of it is, is somewhat separate than it meeting the codes itself. Council Robert Nelson. Thank you. I just had a quick question for staff. Um, I thought it was an intriguing solution. The, um, I guess you maybe it's like called a median in that driveway to allow for emergency vehicles to make that left. Um, I'm curious if that kind of a treatment has exists anywhere else in the city that you're aware of. Um, generally, uh, um, uh, sometimes they're called pork chops. Um, because if you look at the sh if you look at the shape, um, they can be in that format. Um, I am not specifically aware of another one that has that level of spe specified treatment for its height and other cuts to allow movement of sort of higher clearance emergency vehicles, to, but not typical passenger vehicles. Um, so I'm not aware of any. I don't know if Cynthia, are you? We do have. Um quite a few driveways throughout the city that are right in, right out by design. 
this particular driveway, um, it does have a little bit more of an aggressive right out than maybe some others that you've been, um, that you've experienced in town to really, to really by physical design, get the compliance that we need. As far as the, the cut through for the, the fire truck and, um, you know, also our solid waste vehicles would be able to use it. That is not a design that we have employed in the city anywhere, but it is a, it's standard design and it typically gets used along with traffic calming elements so that you mm-hmm. can have a vertical device or in some places you might see a deflector where you still want to be able to maintain that emergency vehicle access so that they, they this, this design is based on that so that a, a larger vehicle can pass through there, but uh, a smaller vehicle would encounter problems with doing that and therefore won't go that way. So looking at the diagrams and maybe, um, maybe I didn't understand them correctly as I was looking at them, it, it looked like there literally are grooves that the, the driver of these larger vehicles is gonna sort of aim for so that their, tire, their tires can hit those grooves to get over the median, is that, is that right? Yes, yeah, so those those locations for the wheel path, and that was designed with turning templates. Um, those locations are at grade with the pavement, so they're not they they are designed to literally be driven over. And the fire department has reviewed that as well. So that I didn't see when I was looking at the 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 planning committee report from the first meeting from to the second meeting. The first meeting, it looked like emergency services were very concerned about that right turn. And um, I didn't see as much feedback. I mean, it, it, they, they said that this was an okay solution. I, but I guess my main question was, if this doesn't exist anywhere else in the city, we don't, we don't have any concerns about um, the, the vehicle, the people who are driving these vehicles, figuring out and navigate this. I mean, I, it, it would be, I, do you follow what I'm saying? Like, the, the, was there significant feedback from the emergency services that like, you know, this is going to be all right? Um, I can address this um, somewhat. Um, we did work with, and we had uh, more than one meeting with both the outgoing fire marshal, uh, Kathleen Summerskill, and the new fire marshal, um, uh, Michael Redman, and both were very confident that their drivers would be able to navigate this. Um, I'm blanking on the correct pork chop term, but um, <laughs> this. I believe um, it's this, medium rare. This, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, uh, or this uh, rare <laughs> pork chop term. Um, and they were both were very confident. Um, now, they didn't mention this, but we have um, situations around the city. Um, we have. Um, uh, perme- or grass paper systems that connect maybe two stub streets that the fire department is expected to navigate and so forth. And so we have some non-standard, um, sit- I don't, maybe it's not non-standard. We have some situations in the city that are not um, everyday situations that the fire marshals um, were confident that their drivers could be able to, to navigate. I believe uh, Councilman Rehainer noted that um, fire trucks now they're by design, they go over some roundabouts so they are, they have ways to deal with um, these, um, these medians. Um, and the benefit of this um, is that um, where the, no fire truck will be required to jump a curb, but also ambulances and solid waste can, um, can use these as well um, without any damage to, the, to a vehicle. I appreciate that answer. And I, I guess my only comment would be that um, I think sometimes we forget in Ann Arbor that as much as we are a center for employment, there are quite a lot of people who live in this town and commute out. And um, the fact that we're on 94 means that not everybody who's living in the city or on the edge of the city is going towards the city. So I, I would be hopeful that um, since they're, they're trying to work with a really narrow lot and they can't make that left back into downtown um, that some of the people some of the people who live here may very well be trying to get to 94 and it's, it's not so weird for them to be making that right turn. And um, so I guess I'm crossing my fingers that there, we don't have a, uh, a whole bunch of people who are angry every morning that they can't make that left. Um, thanks. Council member Hainer. Uh, thank you. I guess this is just uh, continuing up with the questioning. 
because like I say, I think I think this is a neglected site that we need. So the the um, private parcel to the immediate east of that, immediately adjacent to that, um, and then you get into the Norfolk homes and the heating and cooling and all that. Um, are, are are we gonna beseech that owner to continue the sidewalk stub? That's gonna he's gonna be the lone uh, gap in the sidewalk on the north side of Liberty there. If if from what I see, and then I guess my other question is: Have we uh, South Maple Park is immediately across the street? But my understanding, like I tried to look at the alignment on the the site plan, I wasn't didn't have a satellite with me like I'm looking at now, but. Are, 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 is there a concern with this traffic situation that either South Maple Park or Liberty Point Drive or Summerfield Glen's circles are going to become the de facto turnarounds for this? Have we notified the property owners of those two subdivisions that are there any, I guess my question would be, is there any consideration that we might anticipate that those are going to be used as turnarounds and have to make necessary improvements to the traffic flow or the signaling or the signage or something in that area. Is that been considered? I just missed it on the plan. I just want one more thing real quick. So, um, you know, we approved, well, not all of us, but we approved an area plan for Mishcon that actually had, and you will recall, that had the fire department taking a hard right and going down on a, uh, was basically a improved sidewalk to get onto that site. So, I'm, I'm not so worried about emergency services and the occasional visit as I am the uh, a weekly frequency of our, our trash and, you know, recycling pickups. So anyway, it, it, I just, I'm concerned about those two loop-de-loops immediately to the West. I, I think those are going to become the de facto turnarounds. Uh, you know, unless this improves uh, that side of town's relationship with Sio Township and everybody starts going out there, which wouldn't be the worst thing because our housing woes are, um, they are regional. So thank you. Council member Griswold. Uh, I want to acknowledge that Cynthia has been with us all evening, and I always appreciate when we have a professional engineer. Uh, I do have uh, one more question. Is there any crash data uh, regarding this type of design? And I know that at Huron High School on Fuller, uh, if you're coming from the west and going into the athletic field area, it's a no left turn. And it's the same reason it's a sight distance problem due to elevation. So what people do is they just drive right beyond the, the entrance and then they make a little donut in part of the athletic field, which has become basically a, a little roundabout there because it's used so much and then go into uh, the school, and I'm not aware of any crashes at that location, but I'm just wondering if we're increasing our crash rate with this type of unusual design. Oh, and another thing, uh, pickup trucks, could they go through this or do they have a narrower wheelbase than, say, an EMS vehicle? I'll answer the last question first, and that pickup trucks generally have the same wheelbase as a another type of passenger personal vehicle. Um, so your okay. uh, fire truck or uh, an EMS response vehicle, they're, they're going to have a wider wheelbase. Okay, good. I would like to point out that the driveway does not have restriction in. It is a full access in and right turn out only. Right. The turn restriction, the that turn restriction is very specific to the site obstruction. And that is that there isn't enough decision site distance for a motorist exiting the site. But the site distance along Liberty is sufficient to make turns into the site. So there are no site obstructions for vehicles turning into the site. Therefore, there are no turn restrictions for vehicles Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, I was using an example that really didn't fit from an engineering standpoint. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, but still, the reason that we encouraged the applicant to pursue a different type of design was that we don't want to create a scenario where that decision to site, site distance is not there, which could lead to crashes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Smith. Yeah, um, Ms. Redinger, um, one simple question is um, the, 
I'm assuming that we aren't talking about a traffic signal here because it doesn't meet the warrants for the installation of a traffic signal. That's correct. In the AMP, they have seven vehicles, seven trips exiting, sorry, that's the PMP, 13 vehicles in the AM peak, trips exiting, seven exiting in the PM peak. So you, you really, you're not getting anywhere near traffic signal warrants. Thank you, I'm done. You're welcome. Further, further discussion? Roll the vote, roll call vote starting with me. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Councilmember Eaton? Yes. Councilmember Nelson? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Ramlawi? Yes. Sorry. Councilmember Hayner? Yes. Councilmember Bannister? Councilmember Griswold? Yes. Councilmember Long? Yes. Councilmember Grand? Yes. Councilmember Ackerman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Do we have any communications today from the our city attorney? Do not, Mayor. Thank you. We have before us the clerk's report of communications, petitions, and referrals. May I have a motion, please, to approve the clerk's report. Moved by Councilmember Lum, second by Councilmember Smith. Discussion of the clerk's report. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The clerk's report is approved. We now come to public comment general time. Public comment general time is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to council in the community about matters of municipal interest. To speak at public comment general time, one need not have signed up in advance. To speak at public comment general time, please dial the number on your screen. That is 877-853-5247. 877-853-5247. Five two four seven. Enter meeting code nine six eight six seven one five eight eight nine six. That is nine six eight six seven one five eight eight nine six. After you've dialed the uh, meeting ID and joined us, please dial. Please enter star nine. Please enter star nine to raise your hand so that you will be to be called on. You'll be called upon by identification of the last three digits of your phone number. Speakers have three minutes in which to speak, so please pay close attention. Our clerk will notify you when 30 seconds are up and when your three minutes are up. At your three minutes, please conclude your remarks so that we may give the floor to others. Is there anyone who would like to speak at public comment? We have a caller ending in phone number 684. Yes, hi. Uh, this is Eric Sturgis calling in. I wanted to thank Council Member Burson Grand for bringing up the ranked choice voting proposal. I think it's a great idea. Um, however, and I think one great example would be this November in the school board election, there are 11 candidates running, and I doubt anyone's going to get anywhere near 50%. But I think the key thing here is it's in November, and I think that's the key. And I would like to see uh, after Monday, it be brought back up to have ranked choice voting, but have it done in November at a nonpartisan election. The city charter does not say anywhere that if it's a nonpartisan election, you have to have a primary. So you could run it just like the school board and have ranked choice voting, and you would get the greatest turnout. In 2016, the school board candidate who won had roughly 21,000 votes not 5,000 total votes as we had in the first ward city council race this year. 21,000 votes is a much better representation of Ann Arbor. So I think that ranked choice voting is a great thing. Let's bring it up after we pass the nonpartisan election. I also think it's important that we're consistent and Ann Arbor voters are smart. Put it on the ballot and run a campaign if you're against it run a campaign against nonpartisan elections, but allow the voters to have a choice. Don't sit there and tell Ann Arbor voters what's best for them. I support ranked choice voting. I support nonpartisan voting. Um, lastly, I want to wish um, 
Council Member Achna an early happy birthday. So thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. We have two callers remaining, 439 and 882. If either of you wish to speak, please enter star nine now. Caller 439. Uh, hi there, how long do I speak? Three minutes, please. Okay, great, fantastic. So this is Henry McConnell. Uh, I spoke earlier tonight about the urgent need for a downtown masking order. Uh, just to recap my comments for any who are not um, in attendance or just tuning in now, um, I'm an Ann Arbor native and I saw firsthand what COVID did to New York City where I'd been living the last five years. Uh, it was like 9-11 in slow motion, but I also saw how New York used a, an aggressive masking approach to climb out of that and to maintain economic activity and to maintain public health for its citizens. So what I'm calling on council to do is to establish an order for downtown masking in accordance with Governor Whitmer's statewide order, because the fact of the matter is, for me as a downtown resident, citizens are not following her order. There is simply too much inevitable passing congestion. It's not intentional. I know people mean well, but they are not masked and it is a danger to our community and our public health, especially as we are on the verge of tens of thousands of citizens re-entering our community as University of Michigan students. So I believe there's a very simple path forward here. I'm calling on all of you honorable council members to take, which is to work with city administration to find ways to peacefully enforce a downtown masking order, much like our rivals in East Lansing and Michigan State uh, have done. They've instituted a downtown masking order and this is very essential so that we can control the virus rather than let the virus control us. Uh, it's really very simple, I think, uh, and masking is extremely effective. Scientists have found that an 80 to 90% mask adoption usage is equivalent to a full lockdown in efficacy while remaining fully open. This is great for businesses. It's great for public health because it means we don't have to go backwards. And, and that is really the crux of what I'm saying and what I hope to see in my community, because frankly, I do not feel safe in downtown Ann Arbor with the amount of, of folks that are not wearing masks and ending up congested. It, it, is, it is not acceptable for a community like ours that is so grounded in science and truth, like University of Michigan uh, teaches all of us. I think we need to get very serious about this before students come back, and I look forward to seeing what actions you all will take. So thank you very much. Thank you. There are speakers on who are here. If either, if anyone wishes to speak, please enter star nine now. Caller, phone number ending in two o five. Hey, it's uh, Joe Spaulding over here in California. It's been a fun week. Um, I want to talk about um, rank choice voting for a minute here. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that when you start talking about um, Ann Arbor isn't following the rest of the state. That's a badge of honor. You should wear it as a badge of honor. Um, and frankly, uh, it's not my just my opinion, but Ann Arbor should be leading the way when it comes to policy, specifically progressive policy. And I, I, I don't want to over gloat here, but the uh, the voters clearly think that. Um, and uh, when it when it comes to you know saying these two cities are the only other cities that have uh, you know partisan elections and this like what I hear when I hear that is that uh, Ann Arbor needs to be more like Kalkaska and more like Howell and more like Jackson. Uh, Ann Arbor needs to be more like Granville and Hudsonville. And, and, uh, and I, I just think that's just, you know, patently fools. Um, and I'm not speaking as just some random on this person, random person on the street here. I ran strategy and messaging for voters, not politicians for their petition uh, when Skubik and, uh, and uh, all the rest were uh, on on uh, on the show there, uh, grilling Katie about uh, the the policy being too complex. You know, I was making sure she had the right language for saying it's no, it's actually simple. Um, but I can tell you that uh, putting this to a vote um, for the voters, you're asking a very high lift. And I don't hear a lot of voices from people on council that are willing to educate 
um, the voters specifically on ranked choice voting. And to be honest, I don't hear a lot of voices on council that really understand ranked choice voting. Uh, in fact, bringing up partisan versus nonpartisan to anybody that does have a firm understanding of the political science and the messaging behind this, it just sounds like complaining. Um, it sounds like complaining about uh, not running uh, quality election or campaigns. And I'm, I'm sorry about the outcome for the people that didn't win, uh, but it's not gonna, it's not because of the way the game was set up, uh, the voters spoke and, uh, and uh, that's just how it is. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak on Q205 or 882? Enter star nine. Mayor Caller 205 just spoke. Do you want me to call oh. on the last caller? Uh, yeah, I guess if, if you would, please. Mm -hmm. Caller 882, do you have a comment? It didn't take long for that comment to reach Marine One. So I just watched the clip. If anyone wishes to speak directly, please enter star nine now. Seeing no one, public comment is closed. Is there communication from council? Council member Lum. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would just like to note, uh, to respond, frankly, I probably shouldn't take the bait, but uh, I am, uh, to uh, Joe Spaulding from Oakland, California, who has now on consecutive council meetings chosen to call in to during public comment um, and opine about things here in Ann Arbor. Uh, I would note, since he is from California, uh, that California Governor uh, Jerry Brown uh, in 2016 vetoed a bill to expand ranked choice voting in his state. And he said it was, quote, overly complicated and confusing, end quote, and quote, deprived voters of genuinely informed choice. Uh, and uh, I, I'll just make that comment. Thank you. Council Member Heener. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. This is off the uh, off the topics a little bit, but I just wanted to encourage people to uh, uh, check out a movement that's underway um, that uh, Senator Klobuchar and others introduced at the federal level. Um, and it's, a, it's called Save Our Stages, saveourstages.com. And, um, you know, Ann Arbor has many, many independent venues, the university venues, um, theaters, uh, we have a basically a nice de facto theater uh, theater district that runs from you know power center all the way down to main street and and these places are hurting by by um, state command and so I'd, I'd encourage people to go to save our stages and take a minute and fill out the uh, uh, fill out the plea that's getting sent to Congress and the Senate to uh, to um, enact this this bill that's going to help these venues out it, it's I, I think our the arts and the, the arts and performing arts are, are are maybe get the hardest during this right now. There, there's just there, there's no way to get people into a room together to enjoy theater, and it's 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 killing the arts. It's killing the arts in Ann Arbor and across the country. And so, I just want to put a shout out there for the uh, the National Independent Venue Association and their Save Our Save Our Stages um, uh, bill they're trying to get passed. Um, I also, you know, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm a big fan of masks and um, uh, I've had folks write me and, and, and like the, the caller said and, and say, is there, please, is there something we can do to enforce this? And it's going to be even more critical. I've also had uh, people asking me about our potential for enforcing the house parties that are going to be happening on campus now that the bars are forced closed. And um, I think so, some states and some municipalities have, have, really ramped it up. Um, there's talk of uh, uh, turning off water and electric to these houses and stuff. And I don't support <laughs> that notion, but I saw that online and people ask me about it. And so I, I'd like to, I guess I'd like to call on our administration and any council colleagues who, who feel that they would 
have, have some insight mm -hmm. onto what we can do around this issue, what we can do to make the public health improvements necessary in our community. Um, I think we could, you know, I'm not an expert on this. I'm, a, I'm an early mask adopter and I, I mean, I wear them for work all the time. So I'm used to them. I, it doesn't bother me. I kind of like it. Um, I can't, I can't get my N95s anymore for work. And so I've been, I've been saving and reusing my work masks, which is, you know, not great, but that's the way it is. And so, um, you know, I just, if anybody would like to, to work, work with me on, on getting some rules around this that we can enforce or encourage enforcement or encourage better behaviors, I would, I would appreciate the, the insight from a public health perspective. Uh, thank you. Council member Griswold. Yes, I want to enthusiastically support what Council Member Hayner said. When I first read about how they were turning off the power and water to uh, party houses, I thought, well, that's totally crazy. But we have a serious threat in this community. And so we need to work with the University of Michigan to make sure that we are not repeating the same thing that's going on in Los Angeles. Uh, I also want to thank Joe <clears throat> Spalding for calling in because he proved my point. He is a policy wonk. There's a lot of ideology regarding ranked choice voting. I'm not going to argue about that, but I'm an MBA with many years of experience with successful implementation. And there is a difference between implementation and ideology, and it's a lesson that we all need to refine and be aware of when we're talking about a new system. Thank you. Further communication? Uh, you know, apropos of the, uh, you know, comments that were just made with respect to uh, coordination between uh, public health, uh, university and city, uh, you know, folks should uh, know that there have been, you know, a fair bit of, uh, a fair bit of meetings. I've been involved in, uh, in some of them staff, of course, many more, uh, the governor's office, uh, which is, uh, of course, interested in public health, uh, you know, here in Ann Arbor and throughout the city, pardon me, throughout the state has been, uh, has been coordinating conversations uh, in, in jurisdictions uh, throughout Michigan. Uh, here in Ann Arbor, we are uh, communicating and coordinating with public health, with uh, with you know, university partners to make sure that we have, uh, you know, the the rules that are right uh, for our community. Um, whether or not those diverge or are stronger than uh, what might be okay uh, per the governor's order elsewhere. Also, uh, the university in particular uh, and public health and the city in support uh, are working on um, communication strategies to students, whether they are on campus or off campus. It's absolutely critical that we view enforcement not just as somebody showing up at a party, uh, because at that point, you know, things have already gone bad. Enforcement mm -hmm. is really, um, it's really about compliance and engagement. It involves uh, contact and education for students as they show up, um, as they go about their business, uh, you know, whether they are living in a high rise, whether they're living in um, a uh, you know, a, a six bedroom house uh, somewhere, whether they're living in a dorm. Um, it's, uh, it's a broad based communication campaign uh, that the university is working on with respect to their students. We are engaged with it and uh, it's being ported. And I think at some point when it's more fully fleshed out or more finally fleshed out, there would be a high level of utility to have that uh, reported to council. Well, Mr. Crawford, I think, you know, what, what you've heard is that folks would be interested when we get it uh, in line. Uh, please, 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 please let everyone know. Yeah, I'll just, uh, and if I could just add, Mayor, there have been a, a lot of discussions going on. This is um, much more um, nuanced and, and uh, sophisticated layers of, of um, strategies that are being done, uh, much more detailed uh, than kind of a broad, broad approach to, to kind of, Hey, let's wear masks. It's, it's much more targeted and, um, complex. Council member Ron Lowy. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, it, you know, I don't have a whole lot to say. I appreciate Mr. Crawford's uh, comments there. Uh, but, you know, talking with, with law enforcement and, you know, when, when it comes to, um, 
people being compliant with, with our our laws and ordinances. <laughs> Most of it's voluntary compliance. I mean, uh, we're not going to get the kind of compliance people want with through issuing tickets and cutting off water and electricity. And I find that problematic from a public safety standpoint to cut off water and electricity sounds extremely dangerous, sounds more dangerous than uh, the prevent the, to, than to prevent the spread, the spread. So uh, I understand people are stressed out and, and, uh, and rightfully so, but we can only control what we can control and uh and not make matters worse but um so far so good and you know we'll see what happens when the students come back and hopefully the, the university of michigan is a responsible community partner and in public institution and i have faith in our current governor who will take swift action if she sees things starting to go out of control she's done it before and she'll do it again for the communication from council We don't have a closed session do today, do we, Mr. Mr. McDonald? Uh, I, I, you were on mute, but I, I, I infer that you, we do not. Or excellent. May I have a motion to adjourn, please. Move by, Councilmember Nelson, seconded by Councilmember Mulally. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We're adjourned. Good night, everyone. Tom, Ms. Beaudry, thank you very much. <laughs>